Okay, I'm here to do another episode of Reflections, and this one is going to be with Machiavelli, who's an old Quake 2 player, played... It, it feels like he didn't play Quake 3 that much, but he did play for the first couple of years. It's just the game then lasted like 12 years or something, so it felt like he did it in that sense. So, how are you doing, Machiavelli? I'm doing very well, thank you very much. How, how about yourself? Yeah, I'm doing great. It's quite interesting. I did, I, I, just to give people the background story, I did the Thresh interview recently, and that kind of, some people came out of the woodwork then. They were like, oh, wait, wait a minute. Us old pro gamers are allowed to be featured in modern day spots. So, okay, let's, let's get on board. Let's talk about all this stuff. So I'm hoping, much like with the Thresh one, because what's great about this, okay, is because stuff's so far in the past, and now everyone, I've noticed nostalgia makes people look back fondly on the times, you know, and they were, we remember everything greatly. We remember, we don't remember all the drama as much. So I'm hope, I hope usually when we do these interviews from uh, stuff up many, many years ago, people can speak a bit more candidly, you know, because they're not so worried about what someone's going to think from years back in the past. So I thought in the Thresh interview, we got into some pretty in-depth stuff there. Like you see, so, I mean, hey, listen, you know, you know Thresh, right? Some of the stuff I was asking him there, you would not be allowed to ask him that stuff in like a mainstream interview like 10 years ago okay do you duck people you know some people think you protect your legacy or whatever that wasn't really done back then okay he was kind of the royalty at that point in time so i'm hoping you, you're already known as someone who's kind of uh, not afraid to speak his mind anyway that we can just go as in-depth as we need to on some of these topics here how does that sound yeah sure go right ahead let her shoot okay so as far as i remember i've read a lot of your interviews over the years the, the timing of when you got involved in the pro side of, e of eSports, I mean, it's just competitive gaming at the time, you were already playing as like a, a younger guy when you were on dial-up and you used to play with like, I mean, you were friends with Immortal, who's another Quake 2 player. And at this point in time, as far as I can remember, you used to play on dial-up on Dwango, which was the, you dialed in and you played just Doom multiplayer, right? Yeah, I had a $400 phone bill for, for dialing uh, into a different area code for people who don't remember uh, long distance calls, uh, the charges. But uh, yeah, I'm actually, I've, I met uh, all these guys back when I was a young teenager, um, Dennis included. Uh, Kurt was 11 years old. Um, and he talked, he talked so much trash. It was kind of mind blowing. He was like 11, 12 years old. And he would talk the most amazing trash. It, it would just make us all laugh uh, quite a bit. But yeah, I met all those guys back in the dial up days playing Doom 2 online. Um, and uh, that, that's pretty much, yeah, that's it. And we, we actually, most my first LAN party was, was a Duango LAN party. So I kind of ah, okay. got familiar with the, with the concept of, of networking computers together and, and having fun with games that way. Because the interesting thing is, you're mainly known when Quake 2 comes along. So and, and let me know if I've got my chronology right. I seem to remember from an old interview, you said like you used to play Quake 1 or Quake World or whatever it was. I think it was NetQuake you guys played in America. You used to play it, but that was back when you had like just a modem. So you had the really bad ping and, you know, as a result, it's going to be hard to be known as a top player. Didn't you say something like you only got like a, a cable connection or something when Quake 2 was out? Is that right? Well, uh, there's that. And there's also the computer, actually, when, when Quake came out, came out. Um uh, we didn't have a good good enough computer in our household to really to really run the game. I think you were getting like 10 FPS. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of missed the whole the whole quake thing. Um, I mean, we got our first computer in this house. I think I was 13 years old is uh, when we got our first computer in the family. So that's that's I got introduced to the whole thing maybe a little bit late. And even going into Quake Two. Um, I didn't have a computer that uh, got over 70 FPS until the frag, till just before the Frag 2 tournament, actually, is when I first got better hardware to, to, to be able to play on. Yeah, because here's the thing. In an interview, this is what's quite interesting is, during Quake 2, especially, you were really active, played a lot of lands. It's like almost every couple of months you have a land you're going to, an event you're playing in. And obviously, quite quickly, you became one of the best players. But I remember seeing in an interview where you said something along the lines of, you almost described it as though it was like a rags to riches story. You were like, you know, one minute I was a high ping. Well, we used to call them HPBs back then. You know, you're playing on the modem. It's like, you know, you, you, you're doing what you could in like clan arena or something. And then you got a, a cable modem and it was like a month later or something. You were going to the PGL finals or something. Was it that quick? Um, to be honest, yes. Uh, getting to Atlanta, I guess it was PGL, I think season two. Two, I think, yeah. Yeah, season two um, back in 1998. Um, that was rather, you know, I kind of joined the tournament. In fact, the whole reason I even joined the PGL was because of Dennis. I had saw him in some news uh, um, thing on TV, and I was like, hey, you know, I can't believe they're actually starting a professional league or whatever. And I think me and Kurt signed up, you know, just just to see what would happen, you know. And, I mean, we like the play, so why the heck not, right? And um, 
one thing led to another and yeah i ended up beating um some player i think his name was fook or something like that uh, if i could re- recall correctly and um yeah it was it was rather unexpected to be honest i even just getting to the finals um going to e3 in atlanta and all that was 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 a big thrill for me even at that time it was just very unexpected because if people know anything about quake 2 even the people who know the history of you and quake 2 aren't going to know some of the earlier stuff like this they wouldn't have known i didn't know that deal until i read it in an interview like oh fan you mentioned it you know because when we think of you as one of the best quake 2 players it's going to seem like well well, how, how did he not win this PGL? You know, this was one of the ones where Thresh didn't play this one. The people in the final now aren't so well known. I mean, I know Kuhn later on did go on and win another PGL. So these must have been good players at the time. But I remember you mentioned in an interview something along the lines of like, you were mer- nervous in one of the games you'd played. Like it was one of your first big lands. What was the actual experience like in that sense? Like, what, like obviously this isn't like peak Machiavelli in Quake 2, right? No, no. I was very raw, very... Um... Oh man, I remember re- rewatching some of those dem- demos later on. <laughs> it's kind of kind of funny some of the decision making uh, I was I was doing, but uh, yeah, very nervous. I, I remember in particular um, one of my matches. I, I mean, I, I was wiping my palms on my on my pants. I was I mean, they were sweating. I mean, I, that's how that's how nervous I was. I mean, it, I mean, I, I didn't have that that confidence that oh yeah i'm really good and i'm just gonna you know smoke these guys no not absolutely not a lot of these guys were were better than me in my view like uh, i just kind of did the best i can and then felt fortunate that i came away i think i came away with third um could have probably done better had a close game i think against roscoe who eventually won yeah um but uh you know made a mistake there at the end like i said i remember i rewatched it and later on it's like man you know <laughs> If I could, you know, play him again, yeah, I could have won that game. But at the time, he was the man, and I, I was still trying to learn. It was, it was, like I said, it was a big learning curve. I was getting my butt kicked a lot, especially by uh, Immortal. So one of the cool things about that era that people might have touched on if they, if they saw the Thresh interview was the idea that it's not, like, in modern-day esports now, in theory, if someone really wanted to, if they had a big rival, they could be like, right, I'm only going to play that by in the big competitions, you know, I'll try and, like, steer clear of him in practice. I don't want him to get too much of an edge on me, you know. But back then, since there weren't even that many big lands overall, the community, everyone knew each other, you know, and everyone had played at some point in, like, a duel online or they'd be, gone in a server where they knew that guy plays and you wait for your turn to play him, you know. Mm-hmm. So... And maybe you can give me a sense on some of the less well-known players here. So I want to ask actually about this guy, Kuhn. So he finished second at this PGL. A couple of PGLs later, he won a PGL. But he's not a name that people think of on, like, the Mount Rushmore. You know, he's not a Thresh, Machiavelli, Immortal, etc. So what, was he a good player? What can you remember about him? I think he was a Canadian. Yeah, yeah he was a Canadian East Coast player. Excellent player. Very, very solid. Um, the Nice guy. Very nice guy. I met him in uh, New York. And, uh, yeah, just a solid overall player. Um like just like the rest of us, uh, real life, I'm sure, caught up to him, and he just kind of moved on uh, from things. But um, very talented player overall, from what from what I recall. At this time, when you were getting going in Quick, and you becoming a really good player, and as I mentioned, everyone knew each other. Since the three players who are the mo- some of the most famous from Quake 2, you, Thresh, Immortal, are all buddies. You're all buddies from a long time before. It almost makes it sound like you've got to get into that inner circle of practice if you really want to get good. Was there anything like that to it? If you had the, the right contacts, did that kind of like, did it accelerate your speed to grow in the game? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, looking back now, I certainly feel very fortunate um, to, one, I grew up in this, I mean, in Silicon Valley. Um, so, um, you know, integrated, you know, low ping connections, you know, you know, Comcast cable, DSL and all that. I mean, that all came here rather quickly. And I was just around all these guys. Um, like I said, it, to me, it's very, very lucky. You know, I knew Dennis before he was <laughs> before he was gaming God, so to say, you know, and, and um, even back then, man, he was I mean, nobody touched him at Doom 2. I'm going to just tell you that right now. I mean, like just didn't, <laughs> didn't even touch the guy. I mean, it was just ridiculous how good he was. And uh, yeah, so I just kind of grew up in, the, in in that environment and knew these guys. Actually, Dennis didn't even know I qualified for for season two, um, the the PGL finals. I was just kind of there in Atlanta, and there he was, and it was like Dennis. He's like Victor, <laughs> like yeah. And it was just kind of like a little reunion because I hadn't seen him since you know probably the Doom Two lands, or no, actually I think we had a Quake land and maybe some Warcraft Two lands in between there. But uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun, a lot of a lot of fond memories. That's that's for sure. 
So, okay, right after that, you referenced it already, was the, the Thrag 2 LAN, which was a CPL run tournament, and those guys were always run in Dallas, in Texas. And I actually talked about this in my Thresh interview there, because I asked him, like, you know, why did he never play in it? And the perception at the time was, like, he was in with the PGL guys, and they were the direct rivals, and so it makes sense that if you're building up the superstar in one league, he's not going to go and play in the other league and give them kind of exposure there but he kind of referenced something which i know from your career is a topic that you've been quite outspoken on which is the idea that you're not a fan of the guy who was the founder of the cpl right angel munios he was he wasn't so much of an angel was he to you machiavelli um i mean i don't i don't know looking back i mean i was just some young young punk kid who who didn't really have a handle on business or necessarily what he was doing to get things started so i can't really comment on some of the behind the scenes things that were going on dennis was certainly more privy to some of these business realities than i was um i was just trying like i said what what you said with the rags to riches i really wasn't too focused on all of that i mean i heard some stories that maybe angel wasn't the most trustworthy of people um so just to kind of watch my back kind of thing but i mean i what was I really going to do? I wasn't in any position to dictate terms to anybody. So I just kind of tried to do the best I can and, 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 and make my own little niche, if you will, um, in a, in a very competitive community where I felt I had a very uphill battle to be honest. Okay. But, but, but on the kind of the way I set it up there, this is why I asked the question is because since of all the big names in Quake 2, like I say, Thresh was never going to be playing in CPL. He was off in PGL only. You played in the Quake 2 event in CPL, and then obviously Quake 3 was the big CPL game. That was what really made them, like, number one, you know? Mm -hmm. And at the time, I remember a lot of your beef was this Bavages tournament. I mean, we're skipping forward here, but it's on topic, okay? Was at this big tournament where you came in as the number two seed, and you were expected to do very well, and in practice you said everything had been going great. But then there was some kind of issues where... You didn't have a PC for a few days, and you felt like they didn't necessarily help you out, even though you'd been doing like this CNN interview for them. <laughs> so, in that sense, that's why I'm kind of setting it up like that. On one <laughs> hand, you you kind of gave did them of some favors, right? You you did play their circuit in Quake Two. You tried to kind of be like a face of the CPL, and so maybe they should have like t- taken care of you a bit more in that sense. Uh, you know, maybe that was my own naivete getting in the way um, of the realities of the situation. But yeah, I mean. The Babbage's tournament, I, I was ready to go. Um, C3, who I think he took third in that tournament, would certainly um, would know how good I was playing. Um, but yeah, there were delays in the tournament start. And in prior tournaments, you know, you were kind of given access to the machines to practice on, to, you know, to play before your matches and stuff like that. And that was no longer allowed. Um, I didn't have a sponsor or anything like that. I didn't have, um, barely had enough money to get to the tournament. Um, so... Um, the whole situation for me just wasn't ideal, um, like I said. So that's that's pretty much the reality of it. By the time I got into a game, I hadn't played a one-on-one in a good three days. So. Okay. Right, well, let's get back again. So now that we're back at like Frag 2 sort of era, this was the one where you and Immortal went there and everyone was like, right, well, they're, they're obviously just going to clean up. They're going to win this tournament. It's between them. But actually, Ricks ended up winning this tournament. And you and Immortal second and third. And here's the thing. The way it was always set up about Ricks was he was, that's why I'm building it into this. He was always set up as though, oh, he was just, he was built up as the CPL champion, okay? Because he'd won like some Quake 1 land for them as well. People always said, right, what happens is he only plays the CPLs and he'll never play, you know, like a Thresh or someone in a PGL. So he's not a real champion, no, he's just built up as that one. But he was pretty good when he played against you and on, on Immortal in these PGL and their frag tournaments rather. So so what was what was this kind of time period like? What was Ricks like as a player? Rix is again, and he's a he's he's a guy from the Quake era, so he had a little more um, experience. Very very talented, very smart player in terms of in terms of how you play. Um, that again, actually though, it's kind of funny you brought up that tournament because I beat Kurt in that tournament, and it was actually kind of kind of. You thought you won the tournament when you did it? Oh, and well, no, not not at all actually, because I was really nervous in my okay. game against Rix, and. Um, I, it was unexpected, very unexpected to beat Kurt. Like I said, this is actually right bef- right after I, we kind of got a better computer in the house at the time. So it was, I think I was getting like about 80 FPS or 75 to 80 FPS, somewhere around there. It was like, it's like oh my gosh, I can actually see things somewhat halfway decently. And okay. Kurt was still trouncing me in practice, you know, but I've, I'd definitely gotten better. And then that that game just came out of the woodwork. I was just going, I jumped out to some like I think it was eight zero nine zero lead on him, and he just 
man, he, he came back with a fury and it just ended up going to OT and I, I barely won. He made some some oops mistake with his movement and fell in the lava and that's how I won. Uh, so honest, honestly, yeah, he would have beat Ricks in my opinion. I had no business oh, playing okay. Ricks. I had no business playing Ricks. I wasn't ready. If looking back at the man, that was, I was fortunate to be in the finals and uh, maybe I could have beaten him, but uh, I don't think mentally, I was, like I said, I was just very shocked I was even in that position. I know people may think, oh, he was so cocky, but no, really, realistically, um, that's what I was thinking was, man, I can't, okay, you know, can I even win this game? And I, I just really had a lot of unknowns about my own ability in terms of, you know, how good I was. So something we'll touch on later in the interview, as anyone who saw the Thresh one will know I referenced, is the idea that, you know, he you by playing him, you got to kind of like learn some of his knowledge. And the things he was really good at was kind of like the gamesmanship aspect of like how to play in certain situations and how to make the smart move and not just to rely on talent alone, you know. So obviously later on, we can we can touch on that more directly. But from the, what you're describing here so far, early on, were you someone who had problems in like the big match and like a stage match or a final match or something? Were nerves an issue for you? Did they did they limit you? Sure. Um, it was a confidence issue, I think. I just didn't feel like I, I was good enough. Um, to, How is that possible? Because you know the perception <laughs> is that you are like the ultimate it, shit talker. And you're like, it's not beat anyone. It, and if they beat me, they had more practice. Yeah, you know, you know that, that's kind of tongue in cheek, you know, looking okay. back. Um, yeah, it, it was kind of like I wanted to... At the time, you know, there was kind of an image of, of people who, who play games or on computers a lot. And to be honest, I just kind of wanted to to break that image. Um, you know, today I look, I'm, I'm kind of wowed at the, how big everything is. And, um, I, you know, if, if I was 16, 17, you know, maybe again today in, in, a, in, the, in this situation, in a more modern situation, I probably wouldn't feel the need to, to talk as, as brashly as I did because I felt like it just, it was good to get attention to, to esports in any way, whether, so if it was just, yeah, here's, here's some guy who thinks he's the best and, you know, and it, you know, you get in the top three and you make a little noise and, you know, get some press and I felt, felt it was good for, for everything overall. So that's, that's kind of how I was looking at it. So, okay. In the, PGL three. This is the one where you didn't qualify for the finals. This is the one where famously Immortal did beat Thresh. But then there was here's the way I I I'll admit. Okay, since I since I was reading a lot of this stuff online back in the days, I had to imagine Machiavelli. I had to use my own imagination. So I, the way the story was presented, I've probably hyped it up. So it's almost like an anime or something in my mind. So it's like Immortal beats Thresh, and everyone's like, Oh my God, what what's going on here? Like he's beating him. And then Thresh basically is like, Right. I've got to, I've got to get things, you know. I've got this night in which to fix this, to right this wrong. So he brings in Machiavelli. He's friends with them all, okay. But in this story, he brings in Machiavelli, who's also like best buddies with them all. And he's like, "Listen, we've got to work together. You've got to give me all the inside info. And we've got to beat this kid tomorrow." Like, and you, he comes not. out the next day swinging, and he just he wins, <laughs> right? Well, cut, come, is that not how it went? No, it's not quite. It's not like that. I mean, like we got to beat this kid. Nothing like that, because we're all friends. It was just sure. Yeah, okay. Um, I guess you could you you could use. I was using it for my own own purposes to to learn so oh so you uh, obviously benefit it was like a quid pro quo scenario well sure how many time many times you're gonna get you know a bunch of one-on-ones with with thresh and, and succession you know what i mean on a land in a land environment so so to me it was um uh, an opportunity to learn some things for myself and and also to test myself you know these guys were in the finals at the time and i felt at that time i was playing pretty good um so you weren't just trying to help him you were also just trying to beat him in the practice as well yeah, I lost to B2, I want to think. I want to say okay. it was three. Um, that could be, I yeah. I can't rem- quite remember. what. Yeah, that, that's probably it. But uh, yeah, so I used that opportunity to to play with Dennis and, and really just helped him out, I guess, a little bit. Just to keep him sharp. It gave him a, you know, a sharp player to play against, I guess, would be the main thing. It's not like... I gave him the secrets to Kurt's uh, gameplay. And in the end, you know, they played the same map. So it's not like, yeah. you know, they played DM3 again. Um, so there was no nothing new, no tricks there that I could, you know, really reveal. He had already played the man once. Um, and then on Power Trip, we already knew um, Kurt, Kurt was done. Um, he hadn't played I, the map. I, it, yeah, me, me and Kurt already knew. Like when we saw that, 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 was, that was pretty much it. He won the tournament. Um, and, you know, that was... Again, that was an experience factor. Maybe Kurt should have spent more time on the map, but live and learn, as they say. So, okay, here's the thing. Knowing both people, having practiced both people, 
I mean, listen, Immortal, as you already referenced, he was like someone who, at least publicly, was very cocky as well. He He's even, I think to this day, maintains that if the next map instead of Partrip had just been Q2 DM1, he thinks, like, I, I would have got him. I would You know, that's when I would have just killed the king, you know, I would have beaten him. What do you think? You know both of them. What, 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 would, it, what would actually happen, do you think? That's, you know, it would have been a great match. That's all That's all I can really okay. say. I, I, can't, I can't really, you know... Kurt was playing really good on the edge at that time, but Dennis was wasn't was no joke either. I mean, people need to realize Kurt, while he is an aim was an aiming machine, uh, one of his weaknesses, if I if I may make a little joke, was his movement was just horrendous. <laughs> the guy had the weirdest, most awkward movement. I, I swear, sometimes he would just kind of run into stuff, but he would still hit you. It didn't matter. I mean, <laughs> just but um, I think I think over the course of a game and the. Con- I mean, I don't know. It's it's really hard to say because if when Kurt got control and if he was hot, he was really devastating. But Dennis was was really good at at um, taking away your strengths and and kind of keeping things keeping the pace of the game and the way he likes it. So I mean, it would have been a great game. I, I really can't say who would have won. So okay, you referenced before that when you when you beat Immortal at the Frag Two. Even you were kind of like, whoa, holy shit, like that probably shouldn't have happened. Like, okay, I got, I, I had a hot game there, you know, wasn't expected. I know at the time, since you were practicing against each other a lot, and there's actually a lot of demos from the practice era out then. I do notice, by the way, nearly all the immortal ones he ever released was just the ones where he really went completely ham on you. You know, where he had like the, the 20 kills or whatever, or was it, was it that one-sided in the beginning of your relationship when you played with him? Was he just un, unreal at the game? Oh, yeah. I used to get trounced all the time. All the time. In fact, uh, that that's probably like I said. I got in these matches with these other guys, and it was like, eh, I don't know if I'm, you know, quite at that level. Um, and actually, that's true. Because uh, I, I'm, I saw your interview with Dennis, and it's actually true that Dennis took some uh, those demos, uh, made some demos for him, and um, had him kind of, you know, kind of take a look. And 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 one of the things uh, he noticed was, in fact, was my lack of confidence with my own gameplay. Um, he says there's positions there that I had that I didn't take advantage of because I was quote unquote you know scared of Kurt right, um, so I decided to take a little more um, in future games a little more aggressive tact um, kind of like you know let's more willing to challenge him in certain areas and in certain aspects of his own gameplay and, and trust and re- rely on myself to to make the necessary shots and actually shortly after that I ended up getting in a in a match with Kurt and I made him quit because I was in the lead and he was like, this is, this is BS, you know, like that, da, 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 da. and, um, that kind of got me started in the, going in the right direction in terms of, um, how I was thinking about the game and, and just getting a little more, I guess dueling was, like I said, dueling in Quake 2 is, was, that's when I really got into dueling. I did it in Doom 2, but that's, I mean, Doom and Quake are, <laughs> there's, there's apples and oranges there. It's, it, it advanced so much since then. So, um, the whole dueling thing, controlling armor, timing items, and then and running weapons and all that was a very foreign concept to me that I had to kind of pick up. Okay, so back then when you when you described this scenario where Thresh is giving you some help, was this like, a, did, did this period in time, was it like a, a certain period of time where he was like, I'll look at some demos for you? Were, were you always able to check back in with him over the years? Was it kind of like a, was it actually like a mentorship to a degree? Um, Not like, I mean, I guess it's hard to remember at the time. Yeah, we'd show up to LAN parties and stuff, and we'd talk online. Um, it's not like I was giving him demos every day or anything, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I wouldn't call it necessarily. A, I mean, a straight mentorship. I mean, but he definitely did give me advice at, at several different junctures. Um, all the way, even going back at Doom Two, man, I used to have a janky movement setup, and him and his brothers are the ones who, you know, said, "Hey, man, you, you want to use WASD." <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it goes back even that far. Um, showing the demos um, to him, like I said, uh, made a difference with how I approached playing Kurt. Um, uh, but I, yeah, it wasn't like an everyday thing. Um, but yeah, certainly um, he gave me advice then. And I remember, you know, he was watching my games at PGL Season 2 when I, you know, just gotten involved in the whole esports thing. And um, just later on, he, he gave me advice, you know, just about, you know, controlling nerves and, and trying to trying to stay in control of uh, of my emotions because I'm a kind of uh, well maybe not as much late as I'm older but especially when I was younger a little firebrandy wear my heart on my sleeve kind of guy and and I would let 
you know, things affect maybe my gameplay that shouldn't have let, you know, I'd be thinking about things that I shouldn't be thinking about rather than just focusing on the game. And you kind of touched on that a little bit at times. So in, in the uh, interview with Thresh, every time I asked him about like practice or certain people who even he'd lost to in official matches, he nearly always emphasized like, you know, I always beat that guy every other time. Like, you know, no one could beat me. Like, listen, ask any of these guys. Like in practice, I used to just, you know, I, I was almost unbeaten. Like, he made it sound really like he was just a titan of the game. What was it really like? Like, was what describe? You've played him in practice. You've seen him through the different versions of Quake. Give it. Give me a sense of what Thresh was actually like. Now, believe me, every part of me wishes I could just tell you that what he said was complete and utter nonsense. But I'm going to tell you right now, <laughs> Dennis is honestly one of the most talented people I've ever met. Intelligent and talented people I've ever met. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not exactly you know gaming you know new guy like i was always the guy my friends didn't want to play nintendo against they didn't want to play street fighter against you know i beat all the games right i mean we've competed and we're competitive i mean we've played golf we've played darts darts we've played pool we've played i mean he even said you you always used to talk shit to him and you used to be like you know i'm gonna beat you this time i've been practicing man in 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 the moment yeah you know you're you're john it up you're like yeah i'm gonna but i'm I'm gonna tell you man this guy's pretty much beat me (laughs) i mean I, I've maybe gotten, I'm sure I've gotten some rounds in Street Fighter off of him, but I mean, honestly, this guy's pretty much beat me on every game. I'm talking Warcraft 2, Command and Conquer, Duke Nukem, I think. We, I remember we played a game of Duke Nukem back in the day, and he was just slaughtering me. It was just so bad. And it was, I mean, every game, I mean, you can really name it, except I am going to correct him on one thing. I did get him in a duel in Quake 2 one time, but to be perfectly fair, he wasn't in shape, so I don't really count that. He was, um, and I was playing, that was probably when I was playing my strongest, which is uh, before I went to Sweden to play uh, Shub. Okay. And uh, I was practicing, uh, he, he let me go to the gamers.com office and use their T1 so I could add a good, at the time was a nice stable connect. And uh, yeah, so I was practicing from there and uh, he gave me a LAN game and I knew he was out of shape. I think he did it more for my benefit just to give me that 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 confidence that you know you you're you're playing well and and you can go do it and it, it had nothing to do with oh my god i beat dennis because i really didn't he wasn't playing at all um and and uh like i said he, he still got some frags on me and, and and made it interesting so it wasn't like um it was definitely it was good for me it was more it was more like I said uh, in my opinion it was more for my benefit just to kind of give me that self-confidence so what made him so unbeatable even in practice then? I mean, most people in practice, like they, they're going to tilt one game or an unlucky thing happens. They're like, whatever, it's practice. And you were known to have very good skills, very good rail. Um, you know, I, I, it's just, it's definitely the mental approach to the game. I mean, that's, that's really what it comes down to is putting yourself in advantageous positions. Um, it's not about... Everybody says aim, aim, aim. Well, aim is is a is a result of good positioning and a good situation. Is what I always tell people. You know, you, you, yeah, you get the flick game, and you can pull the the you know the highlight shot out of your rear end. You know, but those are low percentage shots. Those are not shots that you're going to land consistently over the course of a match, and certainly not against a good player um, who will be landing his own shots. And it's all about getting yourself in. And you know, now that I. I'm more reflective. <laughs> I'm a lot smarter about my gameplay. Um, but so, yeah, it's it's about positioning and, and trying to get dictate the opponent. I mean, you want to kind of, like you said, put yourself in the guy's shoes. And, and if you can do that and you figure out what, what his objective is, where he wants to go, what he wants to do, uh, you can put yourself in a position where even if he has superior aim, your position is going to put him in a, you know, in a bad spot to where he's going to have to make that that highlight shot where I can make a more traditional shot and look good at the same time. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, it, you, you just want to play positioning, I think is a big, big aspect. And I think Dennis was really great at that. Cause okay. I mean, as an outsider, I might have mischaracterized the situation where I describe it like this, but since we've got the three of you, we've got you Thresh immortal to me, you were kind of like the spectrum. Okay. Because Thresh is like the super smart, the control player who is essentially super efficient. He's going to get the most out of all the situations he's in. To me, initially, you were more on the immortal side. You had, like, the really good skills, but you didn't necessarily have the... the, It wasn't so much finesse. There wasn't as much craftsmanship to the game. The thing is, 
I can understand why if you were kind of like talking with Fresh and he was helping you out and you were learning from him, you're going a bit more towards his side, okay? You're like harnessing your talent. You're learning how to play, you know? It feels like Immortal just stayed on the other end of the spectrum the whole time. He had that crazy, crazy aim and he thought he was going to beat everyone, but did, did he? was he actually involved in this at all? Did he ever get any advice? Did he ever actually try to apply it? Because it felt like you were describing there where he had the weird movement. He's like one of those players where who have really, really good aim where it feels like they move only to aim. They're just setting up the next shot that they're going to hit, you know. They're not trying to, like, worry about, is the other guy going to hit me? Because to them, they're, they're going to outshoot him, you know. They're going to outduel him, you know, yeah. in that sense. It's not a problem. So, was there actually, any, did he ever try to work on his game in that sense and get a bit smarter? Yeah, I think I think at the end there, especially uh, for the um, Total Annihilation tournament, uh, Kurt was, I mean, really playing uh, good. Um but I think EverQuest kind of got in the way of, of kind of did undone him, um, so to speak. If you remember PGL season four, I think he took second or third or I can't remember. Fourth, it, I think. Fourth, yeah. yeah. And it, yeah, honestly, the, the man wasn't playing at all. I mean, he was playing EverQuest, <laughs> you know, and, and um, he just, uh, yeah, he didn't, he didn't really look to refine his game, I think, uh, towards the end there. Uh, he kind of took it for granted. And I, I think it maybe cost him a little bit, especially going into um, Quake 3 if he wanted to compete. I think he he, he kind of let his dueling, um, you know, the dueling edge, as I like to call it. There's, there's kind of like an edge you have when, when you get to a certain level there in Quake. Um, and it's very easy to lose that edge. And, and, and uh, time off is certainly certainly a number one, uh, number one cause of that. So towards the end of Quake 2... I mean, as you're mentioning here, like Immortal, EverQuest got him, Evercrack got to him. He was, he was done at that point, you know. He's, he's, he, it's like it's almost like a rock star where they get too big, you know, and the, the, the drugs get involved, and then that's so the music's not as good anymore, and it's slower to come out, you know. Thresh was off doing all the business stuff. He was playing less. It was your time, okay? This is when you, like, took over. You were the best. You went. You, you beat Shob in that exhibition in Europe. So you were kind of acknowledged at that point. Like, you were on top of the scene. You were the best player. What, what do you think? Describe to me what was peak Quake 2? Machiavelli like what were your skill set what were you good at how did you, what was the uh, general approach to the game on it I can honestly say when I was at my peak there for I guess the extreme annihilation to shove thing um online I don't think I, I if I recall correctly I didn't lose a game online in a duel for about 18 months straight that's that's to me is my peak I mean I honestly swear <laughs> I didn't lose to anybody for about 18 months straight in fact i had to go to sweden as i tell people to drop a match which was a practice match to rufus i lost no the, blue wasn't it yeah blue i well, i've lost the practice match actually oh okay rufus, this is what i'm saying and then i lost the match to blue okay and then that and that was it um but yeah so that to me was 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 my peak of quake 2 um in my approach i was very chain gun orientated um very weapon control orientated keep people off the rail um, just kind of control you with rockets. I'd kind of use prediction rockets to kind of force you into areas of the map, kind of control you and sec, you know, kind of block you off into sections of the map. And then, I mean, I had I had the edge and and DM three down to the point where I mean, it, depending on the sounds, how many clicks I heard, um, the space of the clicks, you know, the, the, the seconds in between them, and all, I, I knew exactly where you were on the map every single time, like every single time. If you picked up anything, I knew where you were at, like just. I mean, I might as well put my crosshair on you. Um, so uh, I was pretty peaked then. I had a nice computer, so I could have good frames. Um, I mean, I, people need to realize I was pulling over 40, 40% railgun, sometimes 50% railgun in, in these matches. And uh, that's with the ball mouse. You know, people are like, oh, you know, 50% today. It, ball mice, kids, ball mice. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we had to clean the lint off the rollers, you know, yeah, I'm sure you remember. Um, and it had a, like a, a feel, a weight to it that you would kind of get into a groove and, and it's just kind of interesting. But yeah, my overall approach was, was control and just, and just wear you down and I would see you in the open as much as I can. I'd chain gun you and, and run you. It wasn't really about the rail anymore. It was more about the rockets and the chain gun to me. The rail was was more when I had you on your heels and, and I could really just put pressure on you. But, you know, but in, and the, the edge was funny because, you know, you look at Quake 3 and the rail could, it's kind of out in the open and a lot of maps you can get it and, and try to use it to, to gain back control. But the edge was kind of a weird map where you're not just going to go in and go get it. Um, if somebody had control on a chain gun, you're not going to make it out of there alive. 
So, okay, in the Thresh interview, maybe maybe you have a different perspective on this. I kind of referenced to him something you'd said in an interview before, where it felt to me like when you'd been talking to him, he he, you'd almost had an epiphany when he described that, like, you know, Quake 2, it's actually about the, the rocket. If basically, if you have your rockets down and you know how to use them, that's how you kind of control a map, you know. Whereas, obviously, like we're saying, people like you and Immortal who had amazing railguns, it feels like, no, no, if you just have a really sick railgun, you can get out of any situation, you can, you can obviously... If you're really hitting your shots, you, if you're in control, you can pile up the frags. It feels like you're dominating the game with it, you know. But is this is this accurate? Did you kind of come to the realization like, no, it's more about like controlling with the rockets? Because obviously, from Quake World to Quake Two, the rockets seem really crap in comparison. It, it, well, yeah, the rockets are are my bread and butter, as I, I as I used to say. Um, that's that's kind of how I made my aim better. I mean, I would kind of tell people I would I would use the rocket to drive people into a certain movement style or move to a certain area to where I had to position to where the chain gun or the rail would be more effective. Um, and not to mention the rockets in Quake 2 did a lot of damage. So you could use them for ambushing. Um, they were great for getting uh, guys who get a little overconfident when they had control and they had a stack. And, you know, especially if you have a lead or something and, and a guy feels like he has to press um, they were great, you know. A guy could come around the corner. I mean, you smack him, smack him in the ankles and the face. With, I mean, two two rockets in Quake Two at your ankles and in your in our direct. I mean, you, you're going to be hurting really bad. So, in that sense, the game was was a little different, I think, than than it's uh, Quake Three and, and I guess Quake Live, where I think you know two two big rockets could really just just mess you up, and and the three rockets for sure, I think, would kill you. Um, so it, yeah, I just kind of. I, I realized it was kind of a weakness in my game, I guess would, would be an accurate way. Another thing I thought about it is there's some guys, you know, I get in a match and I, to, to, to um, recreate the scene, I guess, the mega health room in Q2DM1 and, and I'd be in there and I'd be in a rocket fight and I'd be losing that fight and I'd be like, why am I losing this fight? You know, here I had, you know, I had a stack and I was, this is me, I should be, I should be pushing him out of the room. And so that to me said, that's a weakness of mine. And then once I started able to do that, it, it really opened things up for me. And yes, it's true. I did play games with rocket launcher only. Um, this was a little later. I, I used, um, like I said, it was to me, I had to be in good position. I had to know where my opponent is. I had to be shooting early. To me, it was a good exercise on on everything that, that I needed to improve on. So, yeah. Since I set the scene there that when you really took over was this period where like Immortal had the excuse, like, oh, I'm playing EverQuest, man. You know, I'm not practicing that much. Thresh is off doing the business stuff. Does it kind of suck that when you really got everything together, the two guys you'd want to... This is when you'd want to play them with competition, right? You'd want to get your ch chance against Thresh on a big LAN. You'd want to play Immortal like, hey, that, hey, let's play now, buddy, after all those demos you released just wrecking me. Did it kind of feel like you got cheated out of playing them and, and getting your wins over them? No, I don't I don't really feel that way. I just, like I said, I, I honestly feel very fortunate to have been in the, in the entire position I was. Um just the traveling and, and the little bit of money I made and, and meeting all the people. And um, to me, that that was really great, really great. And um, I didn't really feel cheated that way at all, actually. I just felt like it was, you know, I guess my, my turn. The only thing where I guess I felt cheated was not so much beating them as where um, the people I knew were, were kind of quitting. I, I'd lost my my avenues to have these solid practice um, partners oh, okay. and things like that and where I was more reliant on playing people online to to get my practice in in fact that's pretty much the only thing I did was was go online I did a did land a little bit before razor CPL um, and I need to thank uh, sector actually helped me out a lot there Scott um, but for the most part I really didn't have a steady practice partner like I did with Kurt so if we had to shadow box, though, you, all the, the best Quake 2 players in your era, obviously, like the later ones, it's hard to know. The ones in your era, when they were at their absolute peaks, where did Machiavelli, peak Machiavelli, fit against, like, best Thresh, the Immortal who was unplayable? Where did he fit against all these guys, do you think? What, what, were the, how, what would the contrast have been like? Um, I used to always consider myself kind of a mix, a mix of a style between Dennis and Kurt. Um, I, had, I had a part of me that was, that was aggressive, but I also had... I realized I, I never considered my aim to be the best, um, so I always had that in the back of my mind to where I needed to play that controlled uh, mental style to where I want to. I don't want an even fight. I want to have an advantage in the fight, whether it be position, whether it be uh, my armor and health, or weapon selection, or pref preferably all three. 
So that that's that was my thinking going into dueling, and I, um, and I guess as I got better and more confident, yeah, I could get aggressive. I could really lay it on people thick in terms of when I had control, and that's kind of what I took from Kurt, and I could really run a map. Um, but I also took the the parts from Dennis that I liked, which was um, when I didn't have control and when things were a little more in the balance, it's good to take a little uh, more of a thoughtful tact to your game, and. Um, so that's that's kind of what I did, and uh, to be honest, I I think the the person who really really took that that style to the next level is is zero four. And uh, to be honest, I spotted him in Quake Two before he was anybody, and knew he was going to be a talented player. He was very good, even in Quake Two. Just a little heads up there, because I actually played him, um, used to play him in Quake Two. Oh, okay. Well, we will get to that later. Don't worry. So. At the end of Quake 2 was basically when you had the tournament you already referenced, where they invited you over. What happened was, in Europe, we had the European Dual League, which was the big Quake 2 league there, and there was a team tournament and a dual... It was kind of like a European PGL, basically. And for the finals, they'd promised that, okay, as the prize, whoever wins the dual tournament is going to get to play Machiavelli. And they flew you over, and it was going to be like an exhibition match. And in the end, the winner of the final there was Shob, who was both a, a very very good team player and one of the best duelers as well very very skilled player and you got to play him but as you referenced before you even got to play him you played these practice matches and you played this one game against as a warm-up i think it was against blue and at the time this was where blue obviously would later on go to be known as someone who had really crazy aim you know like ridiculous rails air rockets and stuff but this is quite early on and so it was expected that you you would take care of all these guys in that sense so what was the story there it was something like was that like your first game of the day or something when you played against him and obviously he released the pov demo so that's what everyone's seen yeah um well it's not my first game of the game i had actually i'd been practicing beforehand i didn't practice against blue or shove but i'd played pretty much i think everybody else there and i hadn't lost single game up until that morning actually which was kind of a bad a bad omen um i lost the drop the game to rufus and i came back and i you know i could beat him subsequent game subsequent games um but that was the first game i dropped in practice there and um so i went into the blue game though and i i felt you know rufus was third place guy i was i was doing pretty good against him you know it wasn't really much of a big deal other than that first game and then i was like I, I honestly definitely went into that first blue game way too confident um and you know i got i got a probably i think i remember i got probably like one of the worst spawns on q2 dm1 he got a good spawn got control um by the time i realized how good blue was, really was it was too late it was just too late the score was i realized i mean people need to understand at that level when you when you're down 12 to 0 and you're like man actually this guy's really good by the time i even wrestle back control from him and even try to get my own i mean the game's gonna be over so yeah i mean mentally i checked out the game was over and he ran up the score like a good player does and and that, that that'll go down in gaming history so yeah i definitely uh, um would have liked to have taken blue a little more seriously especially that first game um but i got like I said we played him on uh i played him on the frag pipe and um beat him convincingly there and i asked him for another match on the edge and he said no so okay so he's a guy who in quake 3 especially in the early days he was kind of known as like the aim star he was the guy who had all the highlight demos of him hitting the 40 percent rail you know this is back when that was a very insane number as you kind of referenced earlier and mm -hmm. the air rockets and the stuff as someone who'd played all the quake two people and you played immortal and all this bit what skill wise what, what actual what was this guy like do you think he was amazing i mean honestly i mean he, he's th those kind of guys blue zero four immortal i mean these are the guys when i got into these duels I was like damn i i mean i can't out aim these guys at all like i really have to play position and control and and you could i mean you can feel it like really like I, I don't know how to explain it in a dueling sense but you can just feel that pressure their aim is putting on you and it's like man you have to hit all your shots and you got to be in a good position and you got to be very careful it definitely makes you change the style of play you got to you um, just very talented, very talented. His success in Quake 3 was no surprise to me. I mean, at this period in time where you were like right at the top of Quake 2, I remember a great line you said in an interview where someone was asking you about like trash talking or whatever, and you kind of made it sound like, I mean, I know you come from California, so I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what the, your background was growing up, but you said it was, you said to you Quake 2 or Quake 3 was like when you go to the, 
like a pickup game in the hood and you go there and you get in the game okay and you know you're hitting some shot but if you're if you're trash at the game if you're not very good then i mean no one's going to be like oh better luck next ah oh, can't give him the ball give him a shot people are going to be like get the fuck out the game like you can't you can't play you're ruining the game for everyone so it almost made it sound like you had that kind of mentality where it's like it's i mean it's a competitive game right you got to put your game up or shut the fuck up right uh, well how i don't know about in the hood stuff i grew up in the suburbs man but <laughs> okay fair <laughs> enough but, but i did play i did i did play uh, competitive soccer for 12 years and and yeah there's certainly um anybody who's played or for the europeans football anybody who's played that sport knows there's a lot of jawing and and elbow you know elbow pushing and, and things like that going on and um yeah so you get a little bit of that that competitive nature and and um and you know part, part of it honestly is i was young you know now i have a different a different mentality about it you know now i think you know when people are you know because i still play you know i still play counter-strike i'll still play uh I was playing Dirty Bomb. I was playing Arma, and but you you run into players, and you're like, man, yeah, these guys are not very good, and you know, and I just try to remind people, you know, imagine starting playing a first person shooter today, like not 20 years ago, but starting today in today's environment with millions of people playing with all these tactics and strategies and things that you're so far behind. I mean, that's a lot to catch up on, and to expect anybody to be good, I just try to tell everybody try to remind people that you were probably not very good at fps games when you first started you know so i just kind of kind of keep that in mind for people because everybody has to get their butt kicked at some yeah, yeah. time well no especially in fps games whenever you start an fps if you like if you make the mistake like i did of trying to play duel early on you're just gonna i mean those are some like nightmare sessions you know? that's why when you get good you want to just beat those guys and just wreck them in revenge you know I, I would never recommend anybody who gets into quake or let's say quake live i guess is what people are playing i would never recommend somebody just go straight into duels because all that's going to do is make you want to quit the game it's not going to be fun <laughs> it's not going to be fun no so but uh, yeah so i mean i guess we were a little hard on hard on people and you can be too because um i guess you know you're you're, you're trying to play and you want to play at a certain level and if, if especially more in the team games i guess in a duel yeah. I, I mean if players are not very good it's not very good i i mean you 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 actually encounter more hate um more people saying you know no life basement dweller uh you know you, you get those kind of comments more more than anything else actually from what i recall i used to get quite a few of those one of those no lifers again yeah if you win it's always that you got no life. That's no, it, yeah. I'm a, I'm a no lifer so with the trash talk was there actually ever any component of like just trying to like you were saying here like some of it was like marketing like trying to get attention to gaming and show that like hey like essentially show that like gamers aren't just nerds you know like you know i'm like a jock almost and i'm playing you know it's that sort of thing was there ever any component where you were also trying to like build up in the opponent's mind that like wow this guy's so confident and like there's the psychological edge that you know he's gonna he's gonna embarrass me even in this game and was there ever any of that maybe maybe a part of me um i used to never go easy on anybody in practice games so i guess you could say that was playing into a psychological um part of it uh you know i play guys in the west coast and stuff especially in even local land parties and we get in duels and I'd, I'd actually make it a point to trounce them as hard as i could just to leave no doubt that you know if they were to <laughs> just if they were to play me that's what they can expect you know um but uh no, not 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 really. It wasn't really just just in terms of that. It was just about getting better and playing and having fun. Um, um, and it, like I said, looking back to me, it, to me, I I was very just lucky. I just kind of played, and, it, and it, to me, it just kind of happened. I never, I I never would have imagined any of it, and I wouldn't even imagine somebody like you or anybody would care to talk to some gaming fossil like me. You know. Just, 16 years after the fact to me this is it's very humbling to be perfectly honest i i, I would have i would have figured you know i'm just some blip in history well forgotten and you know it's just kind of like i said it's very humbling the whole the whole situation just be, even being considered to be talked to no oh, listen man it's, it's all vivid for me it's like vietnam you know i'm getting back in it's like the episodes of replaying in my mind so at this period in time we were describing before this edl tournament i kind of set the stage there where you had the early difficulties where you got this embarrassing blue demo which as, as everyone probably knows people have only ever seen the edge one they've just seen that and they know he wrecked you there they don't even know the story that you played the ones afterwards you beat him etc when you came to play this series against shop this was like a perfect stage because you've had this period like you described where you've gotten to the top of the scene you've got your whole your whole games crafted you've got everything you're in great practice 
Now you're going against one of the few people you haven't gotten to play because he's over in Europe and you're over in the west coast of America. And you play this, you get a big series. I think it was like a five map series or something. So it was even like way more. Back in the day, people used to play best of one in these lands. You got to play like five maps against him. So this is a really good stage to kind of show your what your peak form was like, right? And you beat him obviously quite quite handedly, right? Oh, I wouldn't say. I mean, I beat him in three straight games, but I, I wouldn't say handily. Every single game was was great. But I mean, a player like that doesn't usually lose three games in a row, you know. No, but some. I'm sure some of that was nerves on his part. And I, I, the first game, I was fortunate. Uh, I think I got him. I was chasing him down to force overtime. And I mean, there was. I think there might have been 15 seconds left on the clock when I got that tying frag. I mean. Okay. Um, and and he forced me to play. People watch those demos, and I'm sure they'll complain how boring it is. But people don't understand how it was a tactical match, right? It's a it, chess it, match. It, it very much was. And when Shub had control and he had that railgun, which he did for most of the game, uh, you got to be very careful. That guy didn't miss. So it, it, I mean, you just kind of had to wait for that opportunity, wait for a mistake. And uh, I was fortunate enough to to get control there at the end, and and and. Like I said, get a frag and force OT. And I think the next one was frag pipe. Again, it was like two to one. And then the last game again was another two to one. And I think he accidentally typed in kill or something in console at the very okay. end. Because he was he was like, ah, not this, not this kill me or he, or he wanted to say kill me or something. He's all not this score again, because it was gonna be the third third time in a row we had the same exact score. And he typed it in console and he killed himself. So that's <laughs> pretty much clinched that game. But but yeah, he okay. was very good. So there was actually a cool, like, kind of, uh, I get, well, in a book you'd call it an epilogue after that. There's like an extra chapter where you think the movie's end. Like, that would be the end of the story, okay? If I was writing the book of Machiavelli, and this, that would be the arc, okay? Eventually you came in Europe, you beat, and you're kind of like the world champion at that point. But there's like a cool little epilogue where it's kind of like the, the after the credits funny scenes, okay? Which is actually the then Shob came over to California, and he stayed with you for a little while, and you guys kind of, you had kind of like the body cop movie thing going on there. And what was that like? Cause it sounds like that was a great time, and you guys just got to wreck everyone online. Oh man, <laughs> that wreck everyone on, that's an understatement. Let me just tell you, because this guy was really good, man. And let, honestly, we should have recorded those matches. That that there, when he came over here and we we're just playing uh, on land for fun, you know, no pressure, let's just let the game, whoever wins, wins kind of thing. And man, those games were much higher scoring to say the least and back and forth. And and I, I think, we, I think he, we only won twice in a row once. I mean, they were really just going back and forth. But the fun was really going online under Alias and playing team games. Uh, <laughs> uh, it just so happens, actually, it's kind of funny. My father played plays uh, games, and he played Quake. And okay. so he was actually in this this uh, this clan, this Quake 2 clan, and they had team games. So Shove and I <laughs> took the names of two of their, their clan members and smurfed for, for this clan. And we would go in there, and it, oh my gosh, it was just hilarity. I mean, the, the two of us, I just be like, Shub, yeah, you you just make sure nobody gets out of the rail water alive. I'll take the chain gun room, and then we'll meet at mid, you know, to 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 uh, spawn rate basically. <laughs> it was just hilarity. I mean, we would just run. Oh my gosh, the scores, I, I, I just can't express to you how, how good Shub really was. I mean, he, 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 I just could just watch the top portion of the screen and just watch the death scroll of people just dying from him hitting them with the railgun as soon as they spawn. <laughs> I mean, it was, really was a lot of fun. We played some games with the, um, also with the canine uh, teammate of mine, uh, Quaint, uh, Carl, and uh, we had some 3v3s we were playing. And like I said, all these games were, it was just hilarity because it was just so, people just had no idea. You know, we'd be playing under alias. And it's like, I mean, you're honestly, at that time, at that time, you're, you're probably playing two of the best Quake 2 players in the world. And you, you know, and, it, and it got, that game, I mean, when you could dominate, I mean, it was such, so spawning. Like, if you didn't know how to deal with not having control, I mean, that game was just really long for you. You could really get spawn run uh, very easy. So that's actually, that, that gives me a perfect point to ask this question. Since in Quake 1, you didn't have the hardware or the, the internet connection to really like have a chance to have a proper presence in that game. And it was very much a fledgling scene, you know, there weren't that many big tournaments to play in anyway. Quake 2 was where you made your name. To people who actually came from Quake 1, that was one of the first points of contact where a lot of people had that elitism where they were like, Quake's, 
especially Quake World, they were like, it's, it's just a way better game. They didn't like Quake 2. They didn't like the slower elements of the sci-fi setting or the, initially the movement was quite slow. Obviously later on, people figured out like double jumping and stuff. So initially it seemed like everyone, a lot of the Quake players were like, this is just an inferior game. And that's why a lot of the Europeans didn't switch to Quake 2. You know, they went straight from Quake 1 to Quake 3 a couple of years later. Mm -hmm. You did play Quake. You weren't necessarily in a position to be a top competitive player. What Did you actually like Quake 2 more than Quake 1? Um, not really. I actually liked Quake 1 quite a bit. It was very fast-paced. I just like I said, never really got into it. So um, later on, I, I would play some some one-on-ones as Quake, with Quake 1. Some of my old friends who were more Quake 1 players and let them trounce me a bit in that game. Um, different different element. It's, like I said, it's just a different game. So to me, it was... Uh, more i guess it's new i guess some of the aspects of it um even though it's old it's you know it's, i never got to master that game if you if you will so that um i i like them both like i said they're just different i guess would be um would be the argument i, I like i like both aspects of, of 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 their game like i said quake is the faster rockets and everything um uh so i, I really can't say i like one more than the other I, they're just different flavors of a, of a very similar type of game Okay. So since you got to play all these games with Shob and you know how good he was and he played those games with Blue even and a lot of these guys that by the time at that point in time Thresh was out of the picture he wasn't playing Quake 2 he was doing mainly business stuff and he was never going to come back to be a pro again. If Thresh had gone against any of these guys, would he would he have somehow find a way to beat them? I mean, I mean the way it's built, it almost makes him sound like he's Superman. You know, the key thing about Superman is no matter what happens, he always finds a way in the end to still win. You know, it's, it, he's always going to whatever the the odds are, he's going to overcome them. Would he really have been able to handle all these guys or had the right style for them? Who would have had the best chances against him? What do you think? Well, I mean, realistically, kind of go back to my earlier point. The number one thing a, a top dueler needs to to be worried about is time off. You lose that edge. And had Dennis kept playing the entire time and, and, and been in shape, I have no doubt he could compete with anybody. But at, at that point in time, if you, were, if you were to ask me, could he just pick up the game and, and train for a month and be right, I would, I would have to say no. I mean, that's just not, like you say, he's not Superman, he's a human, he, he learns. So, I mean, granted, now if you gave him, if you said give him six months to prepare, I was like, okay, well, that's different. You know, you could probably get up to speed by playing, by playing a lot over those six months. But, um, uh, it, you know, I, I think it's really hard for me to say because when I played Dennis and when he was playing, I mean, honest, like what he says is really true and people were probably like, ah, oh, he's arrogant, he's just talking. No, the guy didn't lose. I mean, he really didn't lose and, and nobody came close, even in practice games, behind closed doors. There's no reason, like I said, there's no vested reason for me to say any of this um, about Dennis. Um, honest people are like, oh, you're friends? And yeah, we're friends and, you know, we keep in touch over the years and things, but, you know, part of friendship is not blowing smoke up each other's rear ends, you know what I mean? So, um, I just tell it how it is, and he, honestly, the guy, the guy freaking wins, man. That's just 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 part of his personality, and one of one of the things he did. And um, I think there was a lot of hate, um, certainly, that he received from certain people in the community um, who probably felt like, oh, I could have beat that guy or this and that. It's like, well, well, you didn't, you know. And and whether or not you could have gone to this tournament or that tournament or you didn't, I mean. You know, there's a lot of what ifs. You know, I could have done a lot of things too, but you know, what if this, what if that? You know, it really doesn't matter. It's a question of what you did or didn't do. Sure. Okay. Oh, before I forget, just just so we can put a close on the Quake Two part, I forgot one one extra question I had to ask you was. So one of the problems with the era of Quake Two was even though we've described a bunch of different tournaments here. Not every top player went to all these tournaments. It wasn't like esports now where everyone has a sponsor and everyone's going to go to the full circuit and kind of like that's how you know who's the best because everyone played in all the tournaments, you know, and you take an average of what, what your placings are. Some players went to certain tournaments. Some players who even were good players, maybe they just were only team players and they didn't want to do duel or maybe some of them were duelers and they just didn't go to the lands, you know, so there's always some what ifs. So a player who always used to be hyped at the time in Quake 2 was Lord Vader. And this was a guy where you actually played him at a, a, a LAN, you played him at K9 Con once, and people always, I don't know if, this is what I want to ask you, I don't know if it was just that he was a really good player and people hyped him, but people always used to claim that like, oh, he was like aliasing in the PGLs and he just didn't want to go to the LANs or something. They, they almost built up this hype as though he, he could have been like a super amazing player and he just didn't, he, you know, he, his opportunity didn't arrive or something. Do you remember this player? What, what can you tell me about him? Well, I certainly remember the game uh, that people remember. Um, unfortunately, I was playing EverQuest at the time too. 
Um, and like I said, it was a no money tournament. I, I honestly just kind of wasn't taking it that seriously. Not to take anything away from Lord Vader. Um, he spanked me really good. And EverQuest or not, nobody was really beating me like that at that time. So he was obviously very talented. I don't know much about the whole alias thing and, and, and whether or not he refused to go to the land. I, I, I really don't, I really have no comment. I just don't know about any of that. All I know is about the one canine, canine con uh, land we showed up, he showed up to. Um, and I just kind of, yeah, just kind of, I don't know, wasn't really that interested in the whole thing. And I was playing EverQuest at the time. I was literally camping out of my character before my matches from EverQuest. Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, the, hey, MMO, it was a new thing, right? I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah. Look at how big World of Warcraft is. I mean, yeah, it was a big deal. So for me to play EverQuest, I thought it was a really great game. Um, so, yeah, it probably wasn't uh, mentally mentally or, or in practice uh at that time, I guess mentally was probably the big thing. I just wasn't ready to play somebody of that caliber. And he was obviously very good. So as we go from Quake 2 into Quake 3, I mean, admittedly, I mean, I set the stage there. At the end of Quake 2, you were on top. Everything was going great. Like, you do, it's, you've, you've followed the meta game along, and now you, you're in a position where you've kind of mastered it to a degree as much as you can in a single game, you know, an online game. So when Quake 3 comes along, this is something I also touched in the Thresh interview, a lot of people actually didn't like Quake 3, who came from the first two Quakes. And one of the reasons why is actually what Thresh brought up, which is this famous kind of philosophical argument that Carmack had, John Carmack, the programmer of the game, which was that he didn't want the game to be like Quake 2, like what we were referencing before. He didn't want it to be where two really good players could play and the one that wins would win by a huge scoreline, you know, and make it look like it wasn't competitive, even though it's just that they're just both so good, you know. So you could see in the way the game was, I mean, you're spawning with a machine gun, the armor, it's not as powerful, that everyone can pick up a weapon, they're spawning every five seconds. It's taken away a lot of the aspects here, like there's not the weak starting weapon, the strength of the overall guns isn't as much because it's more balanced in terms of how many weapons you can use. You can pick up guns all the time, so you can't control guns in the same sense. The armor isn't as powerful. You know, a lot of the elements of control, a lot of the things that make it more dominating are gone. It seemed like from the very beginning, even though you were doing very well early on in Quake 3, you were really critical of it get as a game. Like, you didn't think it was that good as a as an esports game, right? Um, well, yeah, if you were to ask me even to this day about Quake Live and, and some of the aspects, I mean, I, I part of my thing was was weapon control actually was was a big part of my strategy um and, and and ammo control and things like that so to me those elements were taken away uh in quake 3 which is you know was kind of a disappointment for me like i said it kind of touching back on the aim thing um i would i would study players and you know they would have certain strengths or weaknesses with guns and especially because there was a tiered system and you know in quake and quake 2 uh, with the weapons, um, you could, you know, oh, this guy's really rail dominant, or this guy has a mean chain gun, or his rockets, you know, and you can learn to kind of dictate the pace of the map and even keep them away from certain weapons. And where in Quake 3, you know, a rail dominant player, if he wants to get a rail gun, well, that's not, I mean, there's really nothing you, I mean, he's going to get a rail gun at some point. And, and really, you know, versus the edge where, I mean, you could play a map and the guy's probably not going to touch the real gun the whole game if you're in control, if you do it right and you keep him out of there. I mean, he's going to have to take control from you to get a real gun. And even even in, when I had control in, in Quake 2, for example, I wouldn't just jump in and get a real gun indiscriminately. It would usually be after I kill the guy, put him in, and, you know, I'm stacked. And it would be a position to where I felt like it was good to go get it. In Quake 3, it was just like, you know, the weapons are around. Hey, you need a refill on ammo. Just grab the weapon again. It'll be up in five seconds. Um, the, you know, the armor spawns, I think, are shorter. Um, I think they shortened them to, was it 15 seconds? Uh, uh, no, 20 I think it's seconds, still 25. 20, 20, 20, it's it's still 25? Okay. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so, um, but mainly the weapon control, I think, was was the big critical factor that, that kind of changed the game. And definitely starting with the machine gun, such such a strong weapon to, I mean... You know, because before, like people need to realize, you could respawn next to somebody. Let's say you got in a tough fight in Quake Two, and and you know you, you just killed the guy, and you have forty health. You know, and he spawns some somewhat close to you. I mean, he's not going to charge you with the blaster. With I mean, he might. I mean, if you you hope to get some shots, but if you got a chain gun, you're just going to mow him down again as a fresh spawn. In Quake Three, that same situation, he could have all the weapons. But if you spawn when he's at 40 health and you got a, a machine gun, if you have that angle on him, he doesn't rail you or rocket you like right off the spawn pad, then yeah, you, you can charge him and kill him. And, and it's kind of, kind of counterintuitive to me 
because I felt like, you know, you won that fight. And so usually that meant that you should keep control, not that a fresh spawn should be able to immediately take control. Um, especially in, in, in situations where I thought the machine gun could, you know, higher than 40 health. I mean, you could really yeah. kind of whittle somebody down. But that's neither here nor there. I mean, it was a new game. And I mean, you just got to make the adjustment. Because one of the things early on, very, very early, when it was first announced that you were like kind of linked with tenuously was at the beginning of Quake 3, because of this, because so many people came from Quake World and Quake 2 and were like, listen, we want some of the features from Quake 2 and Quake World. We want it to be a bit different. The, the ProBod the Pro project was announced, which was going to be, they were going to try and make a version. I mean, obviously it didn't become this, but the initial idea was we were going to try and tailor it to pros. And the idea was we could use this in the tournaments, you know. Now, in the end, it became something very different and it became sort of like just people from those games getting the, the features they wanted all mishmashed together into a game that not many people played and was a very hardcore niche sort of a game. Was this, this is something early on though that you were like interested in the concept of or something? Or do you think, do you think something like this should have actually been done by id themselves? Like should they have had, like maybe Carmack's right, maybe to make the game really big, you need a fun version that the guys can play where they're not gonna get dissuaded because it is easier in a sense, you know, or not, not as hardcore. And then maybe there needs to be a version for the pros that's a bit different. What do you think on that topic? Well, I think the problem with, with I had with CPM was the whole getting too much in the changing of the actual physics of the game. I felt the corrections that needed to be hap happening were, were more with the weapon balance, um, the weapon spawn times, like I said, for the control aspect. And I thought the timer should be removed. Honestly, that's one of the <laughs> people made out, what's, what, who cares about the timer? It's like, no, honestly, the timer in the upper corner to let people time items down to the second or even two tenths of a second if you really want to get down to it. Um, to me, an aspect of Quake 1 and Quake 2 that was, those elements were kept in my head. I had to keep, keep mental track of when things were going to respawn. And I think that adds an element to the game that's really missing. Whereas, you know, somebody's like, oh, they look how well he times the mega health. Well, yeah, he has a, he has a timer up in the, in the, on a screen telling him when it, no. The, now let me see him time at 35 seconds down to a tenth of a second without the timer, just in his head. Then I'm impressed. That's good. And with fights and, and, going and on. And with fights going on. Yeah, and it yeah. also and it also adds an element of, of of the unknown. So even though you're timing it in your mind, you know, you might get there a little early. You might get there a little late. Those little things can drastically affect a match. And I thought that kind of added a bit to that play because some guys are really good at memorizing more things than other guys and and, and maybe, you know, coming up with um, figuring out the patterns in terms of how things will respawn based on their times, right? You can kind of, you know, you it's almost like you don't even have to time it anymore. You're, it's just like, oh yeah, this is going to spawn, then this is going to spawn, then this is going to spawn. You know, it's not a question of oh, it's it's about ten seconds from now, and and also the mega health changes. I didn't like the mega health change where it's just an arbitrary timer. You know, one of the elements of Quake One and Quake Two that made it kind of interesting was the mega health is it would respawn twenty seconds after it expired. So that meant you need to know either when his health bled down to 100 or you did damage to him to bring it below 100 or 100 or below. And then you would the 20 second timer would start. And that I felt kind of added a little more of a dynamic uh, part of the game in terms of the timing aspect and, and power up control. So when when we talk about Quake 3, I kind of set the scene there that like it was a quite a different game as you've described by some of the things that you didn't like or that had been taken out. And at the beginning of Quake 3, when, actually before the game even came out, when they had Q3 tests, they had a couple of early CPLs in that, and people kind of realized, I remember this is actually famously when a bunch of people who were old pro gamers were sort of like, right, whether I like Quake 3 or not, there's obviously going to be a bunch of money in it, and there's going to be like a, a tournaments for the next year or two, and a bunch of people kind of decided, right, I'm going to go all in on this. I'm going to try and play all these tournaments, and you know, if I'm a really good player, maybe I can, maybe I can win $100,000 or something, you know, and so... Early on at the beginning of Quake 3, you went over to Sweden, beginning of 2000, for this invitational tournament that XS Reality, now ES Reality, put on where... What was funny about this tournament was this was actually before anyone had really gotten good at Quake 3, so they couldn't just invite all the best players of Quake 3. So what they did is they just invited the legendary names of Quake 2 and Quake 1, and it was like you, Lakerman, Sharp. It was all, all the names you'd want, basically, at sort of this exhibition tournament. Now, at the time, as far as I remember... It was quite early in Quake 3, and so some of these players maybe didn't even play Quake 3 much, or some of them weren't going to try and be pros. Other ones were going to go super hard at it. It was kind of like a mixed bag. And this was the tournament where, famously, kind of Fatality really appeared on the scene because he'd played previously, he'd played at Frag 3, and he'd come like third or something. 
But this is where he turned up and he was like the fatality that had obviously been practicing a shit ton and he, he just did that style where you, you just run the map over and over and he, he had like a rhythm down to his game. What do you remember about this tournament and this time? Like, had you already started going hard at Quake 3 at that point in time? Yeah, I'd already I'd already been putting in some work at, at Quake 3 online and, and um, I practiced with Kurt too before, before we left and um, even Jason uh, and Holy from Death Row. Um, I'd land with him uh, a bit, uh, actually at his place around San Francisco, and we we'd been playing it up, uh, just having fun with the game overall. Um, what I remember from the tournament was a lot of fun, a lot of great players there. Um, like you said, not all of them were were in shape or, or ready to play, but um, certainly Fatality was. And Wombat, who had won the the Quake Three, I think it was Frag Three, Ground tournament. Zero, yeah. or Ground Zero, yeah, Isn't he, that one that won. Yeah, he won. So. He won one of the Q Three tests. Uh, um, yeah, it was Hakeem at one frag three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was Hakeem, and then I think, and then Wombat, or something in that order. But yeah. So there, uh, Wombat was there, and um, Laker Man was there, and Laker Man was sharp. Laker Man was definitely sharp. He was ready to play, and uh, yeah, Fatality. Like you said, you could tell he definitely put in a lot of uh, a lot of work. And um, like I said, this is kind of kind of period where where I felt like I really could have used, um, like I say, if I would have been living around with john like and if john was in the area that would have been great like me and fatality just playing all the time <laughs> that would have been really good but uh, i had to limit it to online um and i guess at the time i guess zero four would have been my best uh uh practice at the time this, would and this was early on this is before he really like came it was like a year or so before he, he came. it was like the end of the year well, when he started to get really good i think to, no to be fair now this is what people don't know is that zero four was really really good and in and, and even in quake 2 and i'll just tell you a little story about okay. it in quake 2 um we were playing a game and i played him several times or i mean many times I, like i said i go on a server i think it was jade garden i just sit there and i dominate right the difference with zero four and everybody else is that i actually had to play zero four and what i mean that is i mean i had to actually really play my game to beat him and i would beat him i would beat him handily i think but not as handily as everybody else and it was the point where i like i really had to play a controlled game against him so one day i was like you know what let's see how good this guy really is i'm gonna let him get the railgun literally i was like i was thinking i'm gonna let him get the railgun and see what happens holy crap <laughs> I was getting run around that map, and I think I was down like fourteen zero or something like that. And it was like, and he 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 will remember this story. <laughs> but so I, I typed in my arrogant self. I typed in, okay, now I'm going to try. I literally typed that in. And but meanwhile, I was thinking, sh you know, shoot, I gotta, I really gotta play because like this this kid's laying it on me. Long story short, I end up coming back and winning that game. Um, but it was just a kind of a testament that even early on, his, his aim was so good. And even carrying into Quake 3, he was playing under Alias, but I knew it was him by his style of play. And he was already giving me all I could handle. All I could handle. The, even at that time, going into Razor CPL. In fact, I'll just tell you right now, one of the greatest upsets in, in esports history, history is 0-4 losing at the Razor CPL. I don't even know who he lost to. I mean, yeah, I know I was, he finished really badly. I think he finished like the first round or something crazy. He should not have. No, he should not have lost like that. I mean, he was good enough right then and there to be competing for a top three spot, top five spot. Absolutely. And, and I'm just going to tell you that because he, he was he was already he just didn't have uh, the confidence, I guess, or, or he just didn't end up in the I, I think his nerves got the better of him. I think he said like so I was shocked when I, I had already had talked with john you know and kind of knew him so when he told me he lost that first match i was kind of like uh, what like no way like i was i was totally dumbfounded but just i just wanted to kind of set the record straight there that john okay. was already coming into his own as a player okay cool so this tournament was the first huge one for quake 3 because this was the one where first place was going to be forty thousand dollars and this really was like like i described before i said in quake 2 a lot of the tournaments like for example some european players wouldn't go because it wasn't the sponsorship etc this was one of the first tournaments i remember where it felt like everyone who had any chance to be the champion went to the tournament and tried their hardest and was going all out for that first prize so if you looked on the list of the placings it really was just like a who's who you know for the top whatever the top 30 or something so at this tournament, you managed to make it to the final. You finished second behind Fatality. What, what was the actual tournament like for you at the time? Like, did you know you were good enough to be at that level? Um, I was certainly playing very strongly. 
Um, one of my worries was was that I didn't have, like I said I didn't really didn't have a solid practice partner to to play consistently against on a, in a land environment. Um, Sector though, um, I don't know if you remember him from. Yeah, he was I, he was around with Zero Fall, and they were both yeah. like clan mates and stuff. I think at the so time, and he he gave me a good. I think he came by for a day when I was down in LA uh, practicing down there. He came by for a night and gave me a good good practice on land and some good games on uh, turning two and turning four it really helped me out quite a bit but uh dm13 honestly <laughs> my experience on dm13 was playing against bots um i didn't have i didn't have anybody to play really against on that level like on the west coast i mean there was really nobody it was kind of like a wasteland um and John was practicing, but I didn't really have a relationship with John like I had with Kurt and Dennis and 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 things like that. And I think John, in his own in his own way, was looking to 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 kind of take take things over in his own right. So um, okay, I, I, so yeah, at that time, yeah, that going into that tournament, I was confident certainly on tourney two and then tourney four. But there were some weaknesses. I I felt like my lightning gun was was a weakness. Um, got in the game, so I felt like when I played. Uh, like Sue Joy and, and guys like Wombat and then and things like that. I felt like they could push me around a bit with the lightning gun, so I had to be careful with them on uh, maps like Tourney Two and, and kind of utilize the rocket launcher more and put them in those kind of situations. Um, Tourney Four, I felt very confident, and uh, DM Six was kind of like, eh, I mean, I kind of know the map and kind of you know I'll make it work kind of thing. So um, I felt I felt pretty good, but not you know not like I don't know. I guess not as not as good as I should have been. Not like going into, um, I guess, the Extreme Annihilation tournament when when me and Kurt were just. I mean, we really practiced hard, and we, you know, even the off maps. You know, they they added Match Two. I think was the name of the map, and I mean, we really worked that map to make sure that there was going to be no surprises for us at the tournament. I, I felt like I was missing that aspect going into Razor CPL, and I, but uh, I I was mad. I managed to do well. You know, I managed to do well. I got got a good map draws and um probably got a little lucky here and there in some of the matches i remember against sue joy in particular I, I got away with low health like on on many occasions and was able to stack back up and kind of made a difference in the game by the way because sue joy had a mean lightning gun himself and uh so i had to be careful with him and then i just remember thinking uh against john uh, when he got dm6 and then the final in the final match dm13 and when, as soon as dm13 came up i knew i lost i mean there was just i wasn't gonna be able to play that map i i just had no experience really like dueling anybody of worth on that map so um even if i would have got for example power k he was unlucky he was unlucky because he got turning four in, in yeah. the map draw against me if he would have got dm13 he would have probably smoked me no question it would have been him against fatality in the final i have no doubt about that so that I make no illusions about my uh, where I was at, at that time, um, but I was certainly very good. Like I like I said, if you give me give me the time and the practice, and, and um, I would have been capable. So I think I was ready. I felt ready, um, but I, I certainly didn't feel like oh, it's a guarantee. I'm gonna I'm gonna place in the top three. I mean, there was a lot of talented guys in that tournament, and um, like I said, great one of the greatest ups upsets in esports history was zero four losing this first match. I, I, I still can't believe that happened. So, okay, since you brought up Power K, let me ask you this question. So that's actually a player where I sometimes reference it to the new generation because anyone who knows about the modern day of esports knows that like any game Koreans play and actually go all in on, they get very, very good at like StarCraft, League of Legends. Usually it's the ones where like their whole culture embraces it, you know, and then everyone's playing it and then it's kind of like the best of the best of the best are going to be super insanely good. So I, people often have asked me naively like, oh, but you know, they've never really gotten that good at FPS games, have they? And I always say, well, that's mainly because FPS isn't very popular over there, actually. They mainly play like MMOs or MOBAs or that, that sort of a game or RTS games. And I, t I actually always reference, this is a player I always say, I say there was actually, believe it or not, in the beginning of Quake 3, a Korean guy came over and nobody knew anything about Koreans at that point in esports because this was FPS games and he came over and he came third at this tournament where it was all the great Quake World, Quake 2 duelers. Did you even know anything about this guy when you met him at the tournament? Did he really just I'd, appear out of nowhere and he was just a good player? <laughs> had no idea who this guy was and I was like, wow, there's this guy from South Korea and he's got a a whole team behind him and like sponsored and like the whole thing the cons the, it was just like wow that's like a, a pro like uh, it, it was very foreign to me and it, like I said I, I never really 
I never really th- saw much out of the whole esports thing. You know, at that time, people need to understand it was a lot. It's not like today with yeah, the technology. Yeah. I, so to me, it was just kind of it's kind of a pipe dream. You know, it was kind of like uh, I'm having fun with it. I'm young, make a little money, maybe you know, meet some people, do some travel. Um, I was using it for a, for more of a life experience thing than anything else. And then here comes this guy from South Korea with, you know, I mean, yeah, I think he had people with warming towels for his for his hands. And okay. I mean, like, I mean, no, I mean, he had like a team of people with him, like you know, to to get him set up. And uh, to me, it was just my mind was blown. So yeah, he just came out of nowhere, and he was doing really well and smoking a lot of players. Because one of the things as you went on in Quake 3, because Quake 3, in this sense, like I've described here, became more international. Like a lot of players were coming with sponsors from different countries and going into, and the tournaments were around the world as well. So one of the different elements it felt like it added was all those tournaments we were talking about before in Quake 2. You know every single person who's you're going to probably play in these tournaments. You might even have practiced some of them online. You know, it's, it's not an issue in this sense. Do you need to break for a second? Uh, no, no, it's just somebody, yeah. Uh... That's all right. So... Was this different in that sense in Quake Three? The idea that like you're now playing people in tournaments maybe you never even played ever before. Had you, in, in most of the tournaments in the past, had you, did you already have a background? You at least know them all, seen demos of them or something. Yeah, there was that bit of an unknown because certainly, um, I mean, yeah, because you, yeah, man, you know what? You know, there were always people you kind of don't really know because. You, you don't like playing with a high ping. I never liked playing with a high ping. People are like, oh, go play this guy on the East Coast. I'm like, why? So we can go play, both play with 75 pings somewhere. I'm like, I'm not really interested. I'll see you on LAN, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, so I used to kind of stick to, to working on dominating my region, which is the West Coast. So to me, my, my thing was make sure you can beat everybody on the West Coast. And then, you know, if you're one of the best players on the West Coast, you take that regional, you know, skill to, to a higher level and you know, go against people from other regions and maybe even other countries. So that's that's kind of how I viewed that. If you can't beat be beat people in your own locality, why even why even bother go, going elsewhere? So at this tournament where you lost to Fatality and you'd played him at the XSI as well, in the early maybe for like the first year, year and a half, that was like Fatality's prime. That was where he was on top, and even if he didn't win every tournament, he was always placing highly, and he clearly was like a very regimented player who practiced a lot. And was kind of like the the model of what a pro became in FPS games in that sense. Always had a certain style, a certain rhythm, and you you could tell if he was in shape. At the time, obviously, early on, you were rivals, and you'd come from Quake 2 where there'd been people like Thresh who were fantastic players. And later on, obviously, Zero Fall took over, and he was someone you were quite close with later on. Well, it sounded like in, at this point in time, you, we, it was like a slightly, was it like a slightly contentious relationship with Fatality? It sounded like the part of it was kind of like you thought if you'd have had his setup of his practice and sponsors, you could have been as good. What, what did you actually think of Fatality at his peak? Well, he, like I said, he definitely had the vision to, to work that hard at it and the desire. So, you, you know, you can't take anything away from the man. I mean, he, everything he did, he was obviously very talented. Um, so... No, I, I can't say for sure, for sure, any of that, what you just said. I, I mean, but do I think I could have done better with better circumstances? I mean, sure, absolutely. I mean, I didn't have, um, maybe I just didn't have the vision to see to see how things would progress. And, and part of it is, is I didn't have that support structure um, in terms of um, having that, that LAN set up with people connecting to my LAN server and me playing on LAN or even, I really just kind of, flew by the seat of my pants, I guess, so to speak, and just just kind of played and, and did the best I could with what I had. And um, I guess before Razor CPL, like I said, I'd go to my friends and I'd put in some lands and, and things like that, but it wasn't against anybody who was really practicing or, you know, so I'd have to go online a lot and that's just kind of how I got my practice. And um, you just do the best you can. That's that's basically it. So when, But when I found out he was putting in like eight to 10 hour days, I mean, I was like, well, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, what am I gonna do? I was, I mean, honestly, that just that was just that was more work than I was putting in. There's just no doubt about it. So, all credit to him. You just got to tip your hat to that. We already referenced that Quake Three was a very different game to the previous Quakes. How would you compare like peak era fatality with some of the people from Quake Two, you, Thresh, etc. In, in terms of the, obviously the game's different as well. What, what were his strengths in Quake Three? Um, just the way he would run the map. And he would have, you just have a very steady approach to his game and very, very, uh, um, you know, wouldn't go for, for anything too fancy um, in terms of the shots. We could just keep things 
kind of even keel with 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 positioning and and use the rocket launcher well and make sure that if you're going to come through areas you're going to take damage and and just like i said he had a very controlled uh controlled method of play and you could just tell it was it was a very repetitive um somebody who played and know, knew the maps very well um so you need to disrupt his rhythm basically and if you don't got the time in and uh, I mean, I mean that sounds easy. You say, "Oh, disrupt his rhythm," yeah. <laughs> but I mean, really, he he get into a good rhythm and start running the map, and you know, he'd be timing those items, and you know, his aim's good too. And you got you know, very talented player. Just, I mean, I don't know what else to say about the guy other than, than I mean, he was really, really good. He, and he obviously worked on his skills, and and there you have it. But I wouldn't say it was it was contentious by any means. Um, okay, I, mean, I still talk talk with him today, and. Um, I remember I used to talk at, at times back then, and even hung out um, after Razor CPL and stuff. And um, just a no, it's just a French friendship relationship. Somebody you meet over the years, and um, I certainly don't have any any animosity or anything like that. I think he he wanted it, and he worked at it, and he got it. And that's 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 what it's about. So good for him. As a slight de detour in the story of Quake 3, there's a period of time that not many people are going to remember because Quake 3 was mainly, and that's when esports was pretty much dual centric in terms of FPS. But there was some TDM and there was a TDM tournament, which is Frag 4. And so I wanted to just ask you about this because I'm pretty sure no one else remembers this, but for my own um, amusement, I, I need to ask you a story about this, okay? Because at the time, Clan 9 had been the biggest European clan and they decided because Hakeem and Sujo and those guys are going out to the West Coast, they're going to make an, an NA, a US division of the team, okay? So they got all these good players. They got Machiavelli, they got C3, who was actually kind of a forgotten dueler. He was a very good player. They got Immortal. They got all these guys. And as far as I can remember, this is why I want to ask the question. It sounds like if I could have gone back in time now, Machiavelli, and I made a, a reality TV show about this team living in this house practice, it would be like the, the ratings would be off the charts, right? It sounds like an absolute clusterfuck of people trying to sort of be on a team. <laughs> But you weren't. It wasn't professional, right? <laughs> no, no, but no. Yeah, you you pretty much nailed it, my friend. Yeah, if you could have put a camera, and uh, you would have seen us all going at it and practicing, and and just just it was honestly it was just hilarity, hilarity. Just uh, no team cohesion whatsoever. <laughs> but it was just just yeah. Let's just put the, put these guys together. Yeah, we can all play pretty good, and uh, let's see what happens. Um, but yeah, we we were just honestly having a lot of fun with the whole thing, and. Uh, um, didn't we could have done better? Um, like I said, our, our team cohesion was just horrible. We just completely relying on the fact that yeah, we're just gonna outplay these whoever we're playing against, and that's that, right? And it's like no, it doesn't quite work that way in four on fours. <laughs> it's not a one on one uh, kind of thing. So um, yeah, it just wasn't very uh, very cohesive at all. As a Quake player, were you how much were you ever into the TDM side of things? Did you put a, were there times when you put a lot of effort into it? it? Seemed like sometimes, like when you were in K9, there were times when you were pretty good. What, what was it like in that sense? I, uh, you know, to be honest, I never really put a lot of whole time in the whole team deathmatch thing. I, I mean, I played with K9 and we did, did some fun, and I had a lot of fun with that. But that that there is a learning, <laughs> a team play learning experience for me. You know, it's like the joke is to this day. You know, when I talk to those guys, you know, the Machiavelli. Uh, Machiavelli team strategy is like, hey, red armor's up. Okay, taking red armor. <laughs> you know, it's like you weren't there on time. You know, meanwhile, my, my dually thing is like, yeah, I'm not saving it. It's like, hey, I'm 100, 100. Oh, now I'm 100, 200. I'm stacked, ready to go. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that was the joke. You know, it's like, oh, it's okay. I got a rail and a rocket and a lightning gun. But you know what? I need a plasma gun too. Hold on, get out of the way. You know, coming through. <laughs> kind of. Um, so yeah, I kind of I had a lot to learn on the team team aspect things. Uh, uh, certainly with Quake, I didn't I didn't play it very very much. So in that year two thousand, that was where the Quake Three circuit had gotten quite big. Like it's, it's year had started, we'd had the Razor CPL. It was like April or something. Then across the year, there'd been like some lands in Europe, etc. And then you get to the end of the year, and that's when the Babbage's one was. And that's supposed to be like at this point. Now everyone's had like a year to play. We kind of know who the best players are. And you were coming in as one of the top seeds. And I, when we referred to this earlier on, you had these issues where you didn't get to play much on the actual PCs. Now, since you, your actual placing in the tournament was quite bad, I think you didn't even make the top, I think it was like, you were like 33rd or something, some, yeah. something like that, yeah. So it wasn't very good. Now, unfortunately, from the outside, without knowing any factors, people are going to think, oh, you just weren't, you weren't good anymore. You know, like people had overtaken you or something. You kind of alluded to it before, but, but what was it like in that sense? Like, like should this have been one of your best tournaments potentially 
Yeah, I was playing very strongly going into there. Like I said, C3 took third, and I was the guy I was practicing with uh, quite a bit beforehand and definitely, you know, was definitely uh, competing with him and um, 04 online. And um, I think 04 won that tournament. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was, <laughs> I mean, I was right there, man. I was right there. And there were just some uh, hang ups. I mean, I'd even ask. To, to give up my seed. I didn't even want my top seed anymore just so I could get a game in against anybody in the early on. And by the time I got a game in, it was the top 64 and it was against Prozac, who was darn good. Um, and so that that's not a good game for you to go against uh, you know somebody like that when you haven't played in over three days and any dueler who who's been at top will let you know like your skills do erode that quickly. Like you need to be sharp and you need to be playing every day. You can't take a three-day hiatus and expect to come back and be sharp so it definitely hurt me um certainly i can't i can't say like oh yeah i would have definitely won but i mean let's just say there are people people in the top 10 or top 12 that i was trouncing on a regular basis so that's 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 the way i look at it there were people i think uh that were placed uh, i can't remember the exact list but i saw that some of the names i was like man i, I mean i I destroy these guys when I play them. <laughs> so uh, it was pretty much would have been down to the top guys in that list, which was zero four fatality Laker man C three uh, blue. I think was still playing sharp at the yeah. time. Um, those were the names I was really looking out for. And then the fact that I didn't play well um, was partly my like I said I just didn't have that support. Like I said I had to I actually had to borrow money to get the plane ticket to to get there. Um, so I did, like I said, I had no no support structure to to making this happen. Like ideally, yeah, my computer should have been shipped with me, you know, come with me with my monitor monitor, and maybe I could have borrowed somebody's monitor there, whatever. But I should have had a system there to where I could continuously play, and that just wasn't set up that way. And you know, people like I said, people have been playing longer and they were catching up. So you got to be sharp, man. You can't you can't go into a tournament like that. So at that event was where you did an interview for cnn and it can you can find it online still and i actually it wasn't that long ago i actually i posted this on twitter and i even said to this day i think this has to be one of the best mainstream interviews someone's done in, in, as an esports person kind of like making contract with the with the full-on mainstream because in this interview it's not even like it's just a, a softball question the guy tries to throw you a few curveballs ask you like whether gamers are just adjuncts of the chip companies and whether you're just there to market that's a, and you're you're pretty on the ball you're giving good answers it sounds like you know a bit about the the tech industry what what, what were you like at this point in your, your life were you, were you just a gamer were you, were you interested in other things as well it seems like you were pretty polished uh actually <laughs> i'm probably a little better at my public speaking now um, but no i was just a young kid man um just I'm not really like I said. He threw the MIPS question. I was like, "What MIPS?" I was like, that, that, "That was just a gamer, man. You know, millions of instructions per second." Like, oh, no, okay, <laughs> you know, now I know that. But back then, no, I was that was not. I was just a gaming guy. And I remember he threw that curveball out me about being an adjunct at the the hardware companies and all that stuff. And and I flipped it around like like I wanted to do. I was kind of ready for for that question. And my my whole point was was that you know gamers can be seen as as the athletes for this hardware. And then that was kind of where where I felt our niche was in terms of esports celebrity. And you know, people are like, well, they can't, you can't sell Nikes, yeah, but you can sell video cards, and video cards are cost a pretty penny. So um, that's kind of like what I what I saw from that uh, opportunities in that interview. Um, I was just trying to 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 speak well, to give a good face for esports. I didn't want to come across as you know. I just wanted to come across as just a normal guy, I guess, you know, and I didn't, I didn't want people to have these these images that I think is very unfair, these stereotypes that they have on people who, who, who play games or spend a lot of time on the computer and stuff. And probably those things aren't, aren't as prevalent now as they were, you know, sure, back yeah. then. Um, so that that was always a concern on my mind was was the was the image of, of the esports thing, because I felt like we had to att attract people to watch, you know, so that, that was kind of my thinking. Oh, okay, because it's interesting because actually people like you and Thresh who've done some media stuff, you kind of like ideally placed in that sense because you you got intelligent guys but who are articulate as well because actually at the time and even even in the modern day, nowadays some of these top esports players, their teams get them actual like media training and they're telling them like how to answer a question and stuff because if you're going to be fantastically good at a video game, that's not naturally going to pre-select the people who'd be really articulate at talking about a video game. It's going to pick people who are just fantastic at sitting on a computer playing the game, you know, so there's not too many people out there who can necessarily represent gaming in that sense. What do you think on this topic? 
Yeah, I think there's some truth to that. Everybody has their their own strengths and weaknesses, and and just because you're good at video games doesn't mean you're going to. In fact, let's just be realistic. Most people talking in front of a group of people, even a small group of people, get nervous. You know, how many people sweat or, or get really nervous before a, a oral presentation just in front of their classroom of yeah, 20, yeah. 30 people? So you start, you know, multiplying this by hundreds or even thousands of people. Yeah, it, it can be nerve wracking. And uh, um, certain people can deal with those anxieties and, and uh, a little bit better because you certainly, everybody will get anxious and a little anxiety. In Did the- you get nervous in these sorts of scenarios? Could you, I mean, you look like you held it together pretty well. You look pretty suave. Yeah, you know, um, to be fair, yeah, my palms were a little sweaty um, before that interview started because uh, I was staring at this this camera and it had two eyeballs at it to kind of give you this feel like, hey, look, you're here, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so yeah, it was a little nerve wracking and then I was trying not, just just trying to be thoughtful with, with what I say and, and just try to be, and just come out clear and concise as possible and, and, and you know, better better to take a moment of pause to think about uh, where you're gonna, re- how you're gonna reply to something, than than to just blurt it out is what I was thinking. So, um, I just tried to do my best, and luckily for me, it came out okay. So, one of the last sort of stretches in Quake Three, where you really had a period where you were trying to compete, etc., was actually to go to the first official World Cyber Games, which is the 2001 one, where they had a USA qualifier. And actually, people will forget this, but just this USA qualifier. At the time, some of the POV demos from that tournament were fucking awesome because it was you, Zero Four, it was Socrates, Socrates, I think he pronounced it as. Like, it was all these guys who were really good and like they were just back and forth games. It was it was really competitive actually. Even though Zero Four at the time had become the top player, the games were very competitive between everyone. And you got to go to the, the WCG in Korea at the time. What was this period like? Was this actually like, have I characterized it correctly? Was this kind of like your last big push at trying to do the pro stuff? Because I know you had some tournaments afterwards, but it sounded like you weren't always in top shape there or going full blast. To be honest, I was already one foot out the door. Um, the, the only reason I went to the qualifier um, was kind of last minute. My my friends in K9 and stuff kind of kept saying, hey, you should go, you should go. And um, I had honestly just started dueling again maybe maybe a few weeks before the LA tournament. Um, so I really just kind of picked it up again and was like, ah, I'll go down there and win a, see if I can win a trip to Korea. It was just kind of a thing. It, it really probably, looking back, I, I probably shouldn't have I've even competed. It's unfair to, to somebody else who, who really wanted to probably go and wanted to be involved. But to be honest, my heart really wasn't in it. Um, I just wanted the trip to South Korea. And um, and honestly, I wasn't even going to go for that. It was just like I said, I kind of got, I kind of got pushed into into going a little bit and convinced that you know you should go play. You're still playing good and this and that and then, and so I just kind of went and and I played and I got got a trip to South Korea and um, I mean even before even before going to South Korea, I I didn't train hardly at all online. I was I was working in my you know in a normal job. Uh, I think I was busting tables at the time. Um, so my focus was was on what I'm going to do for in, a, in in the real world, if you will. <laughs> okay. So on that topic, I know that I, like since then you got some sort of uh, like telecommunications degree or something, and you were like I know later on you said you were like a Cisco network engineer or something. Is this like the path you've gone since then? Are you, are you a tech guy now? I'm a IT operations engineer. So I, I work I work in a data center a lot. Was this actually like a passion of yours beyond gaming? Did you just get into this after the gaming stuff went away? Yeah, I did a lot of you know soul searching and just kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do with with my life. Um, obviously, I had an interest in technology and computers, um, but that's a very broad broad topic. So it was just a question of you know where is my focus going to be? And I just kind of examined uh, the peer group of, of the people around me and people I was associating with. And a lot of them actually were network engineers and network technicians, and and there's some programmers and things. And I was like, well, maybe you should uh, um, think about, you know, maybe something in this direction. And I got to give, give a lot of credit to to a gaming friend of mine who I met online. Um, I'll just call him by his first name, is Ryan, and uh, he's like an older brother, pretty much. I've never had. He really, uh, uh, I can't say enough about the man, really. Um, so he kind of took me under his wing and, and, and kind of showed me a little bit about what he does and I found an interest in it. And then of course, um, I took that interest and went to college and and then pursued it. And now I'm kind of 
marching my way through a career. So that's that's pretty much that. I just like I said, it's just a kind of a natural transition to make. You know, what what are you going to do with your life? And just kind of kind of tried to establish where where my strengths and, and weaknesses were, and, and what my knowledge knowledge base was at. And um, what it really came down to is that it'll make funny for all these kind of make a joke for all these gamers out there is that uh, you know when you're playing an FBS online in a tough match you know, really cause oh this, you know, all of a sudden boom ping spike 250 degrees or 250 milliseconds you're like what the you know nothing make right I mean hey that, that'll get you angry so <laughs> you start finding about about the um, ping times and bandwidth and, and hop counts and, and all this stuff and IPs and subnets and believe it or not you, you know you start accumulating a little bit of knowledge and getting a little bit of a little interest in it and I just kind of kind of went from there so it was all just the quest for lower ping that actually <laughs> yeah, drove you it. into this area. That's it, man. That's all it is. I just want to bring my gaming computer into the data center and run it off a 10G connection. That's it. That's really all. Okay. I figured as much. Okay, so after Fatality had the early portion of Quake 3, the next obvious like Apex Predator-type dominant player was Zero Four, 4 And this is where you've already not touched on the fact he was a very good player anyway. And he just kind of, his first tournament went really badly. And that's why it took a while for him to really like kick in on the top level of the pro scene. So he became the dominant player for a couple of years after that. And interestingly enough, this is something I touched on in the Thresh interview, and he didn't actually know this, which was you'd mentioned a bunch of times in interviews over the years, like, yeah, I was very friendly with him. Sometimes like after I was kind of done as a pro, I used to talk to him about the game, like strategy, talking about like how you approach certain players and, and the mental aspect of it, which is kind of tying into what, what you'd gotten from being around Thresh previously. And so Thresh didn't actually know this, but I kind of set it up that in a way, there's kind of like a lineage that goes there because it goes from Thresh, it comes to you, you, you work with Zero Four, and then now people will know Zero Four later on was kind of a mentor figure for Rafa, who became in the more modern day, one of the top dominant players in this sense. Have I ever over romanticized that at all there? It was kind of like a, a chain in that sense, right? Of knowledge going down. Nah, yeah, people actually may be a little shocked and be like, oh, they're just making this stuff up to make it sound cool, but it's actually... It does sound of, cool, though. It, 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 there's some truth to it, and then you got to give credit to the individual players. Like I said, John, of course, had his own innovations and his own style of play that he, he built on top of everything else. Um, but, yeah, there's most definitely... Um, like I said, I, I spotted John before anybody knew who he was. So, like I said, I knew, I knew this guy this guy was going to be a good player. Like there was just no doubt in my mind. Like it, it, he was that good. So, and then John would even tell you if you ever get a hold of him. I mean, he'll even tell you. I told him early on that that he was, his time would come. I mean, that, that I used to literally tell him that that his time would come. And I, I was very, like I said, I'm very shocked when he lost at uh, Razor CPL. So, um, um, he was always the best way I could describe him. It's like it's like Kurt and Dennis, like kind of balled into one, like he he could pull the most obscene shots like he man like because we we had some good games man online like we, we really go at it and um there's in fact there's one i think that's online there's a t4 game i think and uh he's under alias i think and uh i'm playing i'm playing against him i think he'll lose like 14 to 8 or something like that 14 and it's it, for it pretty much there was a point in the game where it was in the balance and this is when he was world champion i think at the time and uh but dude, he hit the shots he can hit. I mean, there were there were times, and you know, and he would know my style too. So it was like it's like it was kind of annoying. It was almost annoying, but yet it was you got. I had to marvel at it because like he's beating me with my own style of play, and it was like that that to me, it was like that. That's when I knew like he, he was going to be the next big thing. Because I'm like I I'm not going to be able to beat this guy once he once he takes once he passes me. I was like I'm like I don't know if I can beat this guy. His aim. So he knows my style of play. So it's like not only that, that I would try to maybe do something orthodox and and maybe put him in a in a in a in a position to where he, he'd be in a in a bad spot and he could still pull out the shot. And it's just like man. So now it, he has you playing on your heels because you're always worried that he's gonna he's gonna hit. Like you're always thinking that. And it's like, and then on top of that, he had a very good mental approach to his game, um, good control style. Like I said, his rail is just obscene. And and the fact that he backed that up, he knew that the rocket launcher was was like I used to always tell him, the rocket launcher is the bread and butter, man. It sets up sets up everything. And I would tell anybody playing Quake Live today, who you're Quake, you're trying to get better, the rocket launcher. It's it's really is well, it's the keys to the kingdom right there is the rocket launcher because, you, 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 like I said, I just can't express it enough about positioning and being able to direct a person 
in, into your line of fire into a position that you want. I mean, it, you. I mean, if I shoot a rocket to your left and make you go right, it's quick switch to lightning, and now I know you're going right. I mean, you know, a quick switch to a rail. It, it makes it makes it makes a big factor. And 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 John, I thought really took took this to the next level in terms of being able to find these little openings of, you know, I'm going to direct you this way, quick switch the weapon, hit you for big damage, switch back, you know, hit you with some more rockets and maybe pull a rail out, you know, when I bounced you in the air and, and finish you. I was like, I was through, like, like uh, excuse me, like he used to always tell John, the, the money shot, like I said, is the, the rocket to the rail combo because it does, it just does so much damage. You ankle shot them, throw them in the air and then you hit them with a rail and it's just like, it, it's, it's just devastating and he could do it. I mean, <laughs> no question with John. He was just very talented. What was the difference between him and Fatality? Because these were obviously the two big names everyone always wanted to compare and how would they do? And one was better in the early on in terms of tournament success. One kind of took over afterwards. How, how do you compare the two? Because you were like, you were around both. The problem with Fatality style, in my opinion, is it's too robotic. So when he ran into somebody, John, who could play, he could play robotic. But he was very dynamic. In other words, he didn't have to come at you the same way every time. And and that that's important. And not to mention the aim. I, I don't think I think even if you were to ask Vitality to this day, that one of the things he probably ran ran into a problem with John was his his aim. I mean, his aim is just really top notch, especially that darn railgun of his. I mean <laughs> it's um it's a big, big factor. So I um but I think I think John just had a little more of a dynamic style of play, and that may be because his aim allowed him to do certain things that maybe other people would be more, you know, skeptical about doing. Like I can't hit that shot, or it puts me in a bad spot, or you know, you, you start you. It really changes things for you when you start hitting certain shots, and it can, you know, it's kind of like dunking a basketball. You know, play basketball without being able to dunk, and all of a sudden you, know, you can dunk a basketball. It's like okay, and you try by playing basketball now. The game is completely different for you. You know, it's just, just, just you know, it's on the on the skill aspect. Um, so I, I think that was a big thing. I think Zero Four just had a little more of a, of a an adjustable style, if you will, a dynamic style, and 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 he puts more pressure on you when he has control. Where John was more robotic with keeping control, or Jonathan, I guess I'm going to get confused with who I'm talking about here. Yeah. Fatality had a had more more of a, a laid back approach with his robotic kind of good style, and and John would really like if you were down, I mean he would run you, and he, that's kind of what I think he took took for me was was when I went in Quake Two in particular when I, I would really run a map on people to where you you're not getting anything. I mean you're really just not getting anything of worth and. And you just keep that constant pressure on them to this like, man, every time I respawn, this guy's in my face. Like, you, you know what I mean? You just don't want to, you don't want to give him room to breathe. And so I thought John was versatile in that spec that he could do that and also play back and get into a rocket defensive controlled. He could do what John, John he could do what Fatality was doing too, but he could also add that, that extra like, you know what, I'm going to put pressure on you for this, for this next few minutes and really come at you and come at you from different angles and, and all kinds of stuff. Stuff to just throw you off. Like guys don't usually come at you like this. You know what I mean? Like, oh, well, I'm going to do it. You know, yeah, it's just that kind of thing. So an interesting thing I remember from when you played Quake 3 that was maybe uh, to a degree a holdover from Quake 2 for you was when you were playing, like in this era, playing at zero forts, or like the absolute best players in the world who have so many advantages, even only in terms of aim, etc. When you were playing these sorts of guys, what people won't remember is a lot of the style of play at the time was, yes, all pros understood the concept of control. They understand like I'm trying to get back into control, etc. But a lot of people almost had it in their mind as though like, right, it's when you're in control, that's when you're going to score your kills, you know. So some, some of them, even even like when they're in a bad situation, they're spawning, they've only got one item, they'd still be trying to force fights. And they're thinking, right, all I have to do is get back in control, that's when I'll score my frags. It felt like actually when you were playing really, really good players, you had more the mentality of like, I have to even limit what he does when he's in control. Like if he's in control, I have to make sure he only gets a couple of frags out of it. Then I wait for like a decent opportunity. Then I'll try and take that as my chance to get back in. You weren't just, you didn't just run in willy nilly and attack them. I remember a great line you once said, I think it was just in a forum post where someone had posted a demo of you playing this kind of a style. And it was like a defensive style. And you said something along the lines of like, they were like, why didn't you just rush him at this point in the game where he had like 35 health? And you said, if you run into a player who's a really dominant dual player like that, he might seem like he has a low stack, but that's exactly where they're at their most dangerous. You know, they know how to play off that scenario and they'll just kill you outright. And it's like, you'll have just, you just, you're just feeding him more frags at that point. And what do you, what can you tell me about this kind of a mentality? Because I think it's a bit different actually for a lot of dual players. Yeah, you got to be careful chasing. 
Um, maybe in that particular instance, I could have. Um, I can't. I don't know what particular demos in position we're talking about. Um, so and later on, I'd certainly develop to be a little more cautious. But yeah, you don't want to. I would get people. I mean, honestly, some of one of the things you do is you 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 create a false sense of of security for them, and you, and you kind of. I've even made it to where I've even done moves where they st they see me running away, and I see them, but I'll make it seem like I didn't see them. That makes any sense? I act stupid, like oh, I totally missed you. Didn't didn't see you, and they'll they'll come bounding up. Like it's like no, dude. Now all this, you just make noise. Like you kept going, and then you just go quiet, turn around, just just waiting for him. This is, I mean, you can do that also when you're low, and it's like because people will people will overreact to to certain situations. Like oh, this is actually one of the things I learned. One tactic from Dennis that goes way back, and everybody be like, ah, anybody does that now. It's like, well, yeah, but at the time, you know, this was kind of newer. It was just, it, even though you're in a hurt position, let's say you have enough to where you could really make a stand. So what you do is you run and then to put them into a position where they're chasing you through, you know, tight door, tight corridor, or whatever. And then all of a sudden, you just turn around and run right back at them and get offensive. And because they're offense, so offensive, they're not defensive. You see what I mean? So, so they're they're putting themselves in a position to where you can totally line up your shots. And and granted, you're risking you know dying, but they're the ones with control. So if you can kind of take this this uh, mitigated risk, I guess, and then kind of just turn around and end up in their face, sometimes it'll catch players off guard. That that sudden change of oh wait a minute, he was defensive, he's running away. Wait a minute, oh shoot, he's right there. He wasn't being defensive as a trap. You know what I mean? Like. Um, there's that mental aspect, I guess, of it. So, um, but yeah, you want to limit, limit how many frags you give up. I mean, honestly, that that's really the name of the game. And then when you get at the top level, I mean, that's why I explain to people those games against Shub were solo scoring. It's because uh, I'm I'm trying to wait for an opening, a mistake, a you know, I can't just I'm just gonna just charge in there and keep fighting him. I mean, it's gonna be feeding him frags is all that's gonna do. Um, like I said, it, at that level, these guys. They don't miss. I mean, they really don't miss very much. So you, you got to pick your spots. Uh, hope they miss time something. Um, run them into a trap. Run them in through some grenade launchers, some rockets, some, you know, kind of even things up. Maybe even even if you can knock them into, you know, depending on the map, you know, you get in a rocket fight, you knock them down into a lower bad position, and now they have to run to something else that makes them miss a respawn on a mega health or a red armor. That's how you get back control. Is you, you disrupt that timing of... of, of the item running and, and control and you just kind of kind of just mitigate how much you're going to be hit and 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 get your stack up you know what i mean get your stack up and then try to disrupt you try to disrupt and and, and once you get the mega and red red things then you can look to apply pressure but that's 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 it i guess so if you were so competitive when you played and when like you were saying here back in quake 2 you didn't even take like a practice off like if you're playing someone in practice you still wanted to send a message like you know i'm i'm beat you now i'll beat you next time if you were so competitive and you were so going all out how do you i know obviously at real life situations I mean you can't necessarily compete in tournaments and stuff like that. does that ever turn off like do you years after the fact when you play games now are you more chilled out do you just relax you're just having fun are you still trying to be really good in some sense <laughs> yeah sure i mean you, I, you don't play you don't play things to lose right i mean winning is certainly more enjoyable than than losing um i've been playing games throughout the years uh um, like I said, I'm still I'm still pretty good when I put in enough time and things like that. Um, certainly gotten some accusations here and there over the years in various games, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, I mean I, I have a competitive attitude, I guess. Yeah, I, but but not so much like I, not like before. I would think I, I would I would imagine I'm much more laid back about it now because I mean I mean people understand there was a lot of pressure. Um, even in even in Razor CPL and in, in Babbage's and things like that, like I said, I was really thinking about what I wanted to do with my life in terms of an actual career, and and that that weighed heavily, very heavily on my mind in terms of because I didn't know what I want to do, or you know I had no college education started yet, and so I, you know I was kind of a late bloomer, and um, so the, these are very real concerns for me, and taking that into a match into a game and trying to compete and being like, you know, I have to do this. I have to leave here. I don't do this. You know, that, that's, that's putting way too much pressure on yourself. You know what I mean? It's, it's just, I honestly think if I had I mean, today's situation, I'd probably play a lot more carefree and maybe even a little, a little better mentally, but maybe not so much physically, but <laughs> probably better mentally than I did. 
what do you do in terms of modern games though? Because a lot of the modern games now, like FPS in terms of individual FPS, the dual types, it's, it's not really present that much now in esports. It doesn't really have a place. Even when people play, like you referenced here, they're either playing fun FPS like Dirty Bomb or it's CSGO and that's, very, that's obviously Counter-Strike to Quake was, was chalk and cheese then. No, it did, there wasn't a lot of crossover. This is a very different type of game. So what, what games attract you now? Like I, I, you, said, you mentioned CSGO before. Do you play some CSGO now? I just kind of picked it up by <laughs> funny story. I saw an article on or a forum post in East Reality about how Quake players can't play CS. So I thought I'd just try this theory out. You know that, that we're not any good at CS. So <laughs> I got about a, I think like 260 hours in, not all at once. I think I just picked it up again. Um, I played. I think I played for almost eight, maybe eight months to a year in 1.5. Played Call of Duty a little bit too. When that was a modern Modern Warfare, Call of Duty Two, Modern okay. Warfare. Played that. Uh, yeah, I played Dirty Bomb. Um, I love the Total War series. I'm I'm a bit of a strategy nerd. Um, I don't know if you know familiar with those Total Wars, like uh, Total War Shogun Two. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Rome Two and all those. Long. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've beaten those on Legendary mode. I'm quite a, and I've played Civ. I play Civilization. I've I've beaten that on Emperor. Emperor difficulty. Um, so I like my strategy games. I know, I'm just an all-around gamer, man. I've played StarCraft, StarCraft II, World of Warcraft. Um, so pretty much I've been hitting all the major titles <laughs> through the years. Um, just kind of just having fun with games and, and enjoying the, the not being so serious about winning, winning, winning. And just kind of going from game to game and, and having fun. And I actually downloaded, I actually got Rocket League recently, which has <laughs> been a little bit addicting. Yeah, everyone says that's fun. Yeah. Is there, a, after all the years you competed and all the different games you got to go through because you were pro for, for, that, for that many different transition periods? Because back then, a game used to last one year, two years. It wasn't like 10 years like they, they got for some of them now. Is there a player who you could reference where maybe this guy was really good, but I don't know, nerves at lands got to him or something? Someone who had a lot of talent, but they just never were able to show it in terms of like placings, or we don't think of them as a great Quake player or something. Is there someone who, who comes to mind in that sense where they, this really could have been an all-time great player, but so, something didn't work out, you know? Oh, there's certainly, I mean, lots of great players from, I mean, B2 certainly comes to mind. Um, you know, kind of, was always kind of playing in Dennis's shadow, but he was very good and beat a lot of top players. Um, Unholy was another one uh, placed very well in some tournaments had some third fourth place finishes very talented um, in terms of it's kind of hard to, to think how things could have turned out maybe if, you know because Unholy was playing like on an ISDN connect for a while his connection was kind of crappy and um, certainly you got to wonder if Fatality wasn't an HPB from, from you know earlier on maybe if he had broadband earlier on maybe he would have came on the scene faster um it's really hard to say man it, because the time times were really different back then like i said there was still you still had some people playing on modem and um the scene just wasn't as as developed as it is today so it, it's kind of hard to say say if people didn't really could have done better i mean there were a lot of talented guys and um i can't really say i mean I guess I guess a lot of people could have done a little bit better, even myself included. I guess, but I just kind of consider everybody did what they could and the bit with what they had. So I don't really okay. get into to uh, you know maybe some guy could have done really good or I mean I, in my opinion, I mean people are going to disagree. I thought Dennis hit it pretty well, which that you know it was pretty well established who who was good, and people can say this guy or that guy didn't yeah. get the show up. Well, now you're now you're just nitpicking. I mean, you can do that with pretty much anything. You'd be like, well, that one guy way over here, you know, he was really good, but he didn't prove it against anybody. Well, and then it really doesn't matter, does it? So, I mean, that that's just how it is. You either did it or you didn't. So I, I don't get into the what ifs of it. So I've got an anecdote. Okay, as so we're kind of like wrapping up that, I've got an anecdote that that you told. I think it was like middle 2000s maybe this is a period of time when you'd been out of quake a long time and a demo appeared on es reality and in the demo machiavelli goes on to some west coast dual server in quake 2 and he's just playing around he's just you know it's like a fresh install or something on on someone else's computer even or something i think you're playing and you play some guy and he beats you or something or he, he wins or something and he and he see, he talks a bit of shit or something and you say like right well even though it's not my setup, I don't have my config and everything, you're sort of like, right, let's go, let's have a proper game now. And you obviously, 
for the sake of the story. You obviously beat him in this demo. You have no crosshair or something. You beat him on, on the edge. And after the fact, okay, it kind of highlights this aspect where you had like a super competitive personality. And also, I, I also get the sense that as part of the shit talking as well as you like it when other people shit talk to you, right? That's like, that was part of the enjoyment. It kind of gets you, gets you, gets the fire going a bit, right? And so it sounded like to you, in a sense, there was always the law of duel in that sense. You wanted to have like, you test your metal against someone else to see how good you really are. What, what what is it? have you always been like this? Like, is it, is it a problem for you in a sense that there's not an is there out is there an outlet like that still for you in any sense in life? <laughs> I've always hated to lose, even even as a kid um, in soccer and stuff. Like I said, I played competitive soccer. I didn't just play on the the lower division team. I was on our select team for the city, and we did some traveling. And um, one of my friends, um, you know, I used to play soccer with, ended up being a professional soccer player in, in the MLS and all that. Um, so I guess that competitive attitude kind of always carried over um i just i just hate i hate the lose i really hate to lose like in anything i hate to lose and it's just kind of um it's a healthy hate you know i think that's one of the one of the healthiest things people can dislike is losing you don't want to be i mean not that there's anything wrong everybody has their failures and and, and losses in life and you got to learn from those but it's not something you want to enjoy you know, or me, enjoy making a habit out of, I guess. Uh, so um, I've always had that competitive nature of, you know, me against that other guy, the the one on one um, aspect of it. And uh, actually, let me give you a little tidbit, a little family tidbit. So I told you my father would uh, play Quake too. So he'd be on these uh, free for all servers, and people would talk crap. You know, like you said, right? Get competitive. People be ah, uh-uh, you're a camper. This and that. And, Oh, if it was a duel, I would, I would, I would smoke you in a duel. Little did they know he had a son to play as his ringer. My father would literally wake me up, even if it was late in the evening, and say, "Hey, I got this guy talking crap. We're gonna duel. Come duel him for me." So I used to go, even if it was the middle of the night. What my father used to make me smurf for him because he would get the talking contest with somebody alive okay. and it would end up being a duel and then little did they know they were playing Machiavelli they weren't playing who they thought they were playing and uh, it was so bad this one guy got smoked so bad he was so convinced that I was I was nothing but ping and he was an HPB okay but so he's like play me on my LAN I'm like huh I'm like okay fine give me an IP I literally connected this guy's server probably about 600 to 800 ping I think it was around 800 ping and I played him. I actually went through with the duel with an 800 ping, and I was beating him. <laughs> and the fun, the breaking point of him calling me a hacker, because I knew it was coming. I was like, there's no way this guy's not going to call me a hacker if I'm beating him with a 600 plus ping or whatever it was. It was ridiculous. I mean, like, it, to give you an example, like, if I needed to shoot you over here, you know what I mean? I would aim my chain gun way over here as you're moving towards it like i would have it was just so ridiculous the, the lag so the point in time the breaking point was i actually heard him spawn off he went up up the elevator on dm1 and he jumped off i heard him grab the shards going to the rocket launcher the upper rocket launcher i'm like i'm gonna time this railgun shot you know i'm like i'm timing it in my head how long it's gonna take him to jump over to the rocket launcher and so i hit the button and i'm at the doorway leaving and people remember the mega health you could see it and i'm looking at it I, I hit the button i'm literally i'm running i run into the room because the lag was so long i could hit the shot and start moving because the railgun shot's not going to go for like a second i'm literally in the middle of the room going towards the chain gun and i see a death message he got hit with the rail and he's like hacker hacker bot like no way like the and I, it was just so amazing i used to do these things uh in, in quake too but yeah it's that that's actually a little funny story that i beat somebody on his hbb uh lan with like an 800 ping and uh yeah made made him rage quit <laughs> okay so when this is normally the sort of question someone would have at the beginning of the interview, okay? But I thought actually with the timing of it, it made sense to put it at the end here, which is your alias, Machiavelli, comes from an alias that Tupac used, the Tupac Shakur, the rapper, towards the end of his life. It was his final album, which actually he died just before it came out. Now, at the time, listen, you, you grew up on the West Coast. That was sort of the era of when this sort of music was around. It was very popular. And obviously, you picked it as your alias, but you were a younger guy when you did so. And you, I remember you saying in some interviews, like, he was an artist that was important to you and whatnot. Was that just, like, a phase you were going through? Is this someone, Are you still interested in his music now? Is What, what is it like? Uh, no, I still I still love his music. I think it was very powerful lyrics. Um, some of the things he talked about are very, very real issues. 
Um, but yeah, certainly some of it's more of a younger phase, a young man thing. Um, not that I don't dis- I don't dislike the music now. I mean, I certainly still enjoy it. Um, but I wouldn't say it's <laughs> it's an impact on me um, in, in that way. I just think as a young man and, and some of the realities of, of the world start coming more into focus, um, I thought the music was very powerful and um, poetic, I guess. It's, uh, he has a poetry about to his style. And I thought the name was catchy. So the name was kind of cool. And then I kind of went with that. I mean, it's a good alias also to pick if you're going to be kind of like a trash talker and you're going to be like very out there in terms of the things you're willing to say and you're a West Coast guy. It fits, right? Yeah, I, I thought I thought the whole thing fit. That was kind of it. I mean, I used to just play, I used to honestly just play as Victor. That, that, that was my name. I would play yeah, Victor. Very simple. You can even, um, in Duango, that was my login, Victor. I mean, that, that was it. <laughs> I mean, what's what's this online alias thing? I mean, I mean, yeah, so... So that that's kind of came up with it, and it was kind of started because Kurt had his uh, alias Immortal, and I was like, hmm, I was like, well, I guess I should come up with something too, and I was just kind of, yeah, it just kind of fell on Machiavelli. I don't even know, I can't even remember when I first put it on, to be honest. Like, decided to, I can't even remember when I did. I just said, ah, it seems pretty good. I'll just go with this for a while, and it just kind of stuck. So one of the themes, especially earlier in this interview, I mean, what I just referenced, the anecdote there where the guy beat you and so then he was kind of talking shit. So you had to kind of like, give, you had to smack him down just to show him like, listen, us old school players can still play. One of the things I remember you said in this demo was you said something along the lines of like, hey, buddy, like the moves that you're doing now, like the trick jumps, we, me and my friends invented those. So as I've kind of referred at the beginning of the interview, okay, you knew these guys are mortal fresh before they were the, the, the gods of Quake, you know, so... Is it kind of a bit surreal to you with how big esports is now that some of this stuff, especially the Quake stuff, was literally you and people you were friends with who kind of were like the key role players early on in it? I, again, I, I just have to reiterate to people how, how lucky and, and humbled I feel just to be a part of all of it. Um, so to me, I look, I just be honest, I've been completely out of the loop. I had, I had no clue what's been going on. I just, I mean, figured out how to set up my Twitter and I mean, my Twitch account, <laughs> just, I mean, maybe a month ago or so. Um, so like you said, this is, this is all new to me again. Um, so it's kind of cool when I, when I look at it and I, I started to play CS, I'm like, what's this? They have ESL. I'm like, what, what's the ESL? Like people are like, what, you don't know what the ESL is? I'm like, yeah, I don't know. What the, I mean, I really don't. I mean, I kind of know, but I don't really, I didn't know how big it was or how popular it was or, or what was involved or the teams or sponsors. I, I really didn't know. And, and when I saw the numbers of how many millions of people were watching, I was like a little dumbfounded. And, and just, just the fact that I, I, I would hope I helped contribute to, to start some of this esports thing. And I have a part of that history. Like I said, it's, it's very humbling. And um, like I said, it, it, it like I said, this is just stuff I didn't think anybody really cared about. Like, so even in my personal life, I, most people, they, I don't just say, hey, did you know I played professional game? I mean, it kind of comes up sometimes in conversations when they ask, you know, if you play games and stuff. I mean, then it kind of comes up, but it's not something I ever envisioned anybody would really care about. Like, like today, like if you were to ask me 20, you know, 15 years ago, if anybody would be interviewing me today at 36 years old, you know, asking me about my gaming history, I would probably say, no, nobody probably would, will care about me at that time. You know, nobody's going to care. I mean, it, it, I didn't even, like I said, I didn't even think it, it would maybe even go anywhere. Like I so said, the whole thing is kind of a pipe dream to me. So everything, yeah, it is, it is very surreal um, seeing how large it is. And, and <laughs> maybe one day we'll be even older men and they'll be, you know, looking back and maybe they'll be in eSports Hall of Fame one day or something. I don't know, <laughs> you know, but it's kind of, it is kind of surreal to think about. And I'm just glad I, I had a small part of it, a small part to play in it. It's just, it's, like I said, it's very humbling. So one of the things I actually really liked about your career is when I've mentioned some of these names like Thresh, Fatality, Zero Four, some of these guys who were like the number one dueler and they were so focused on being the number one and everything was about like they only played certain tournaments and whatnot. Some of them weren't as outgoing or, or kind of like involved in the community aspect but it seemed like throughout your career you were always really you always thought it was important that like gamers speak out about things and that gamers play other gamers in the community and you can't like it like i'm mentioning here we're talking with zero four kind of like passing on information to other players and stuff and kind of like helping the game itself stay healthy so to close up the interview as kind of like a final message do you have like a little bit of wisdom you can give to like the modern gamers now or people who are trying to be pros now just like some 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 things you've learned or some some key guidelines you think are interesting um if you're trying to get good i would say patience um watch demos 
and just keep an open mind. Don't, um, you know, people have a tendency today, uh, just even put yourself in bad positions. You can be like, oh, my team was stacked. You know what? Use that opportunity. If your team is stacked against you, let's say CS is an example, use that as an opportunity to hone your skills in because you're going to be in a bad situation at some point in a competitive match too. Maybe your team's down and out, whatever. Um, just just kind of have that patience and, and realize that everything will happen in time if you work at it. Um, and as for the players that are already on top, I would, I would just say remember that, that the community is needed in order for esports to be vibrant. And it's important to be supportive to, to newer players and, and players who, who are trying to figure things out. It's, it's good to give them that little bit of helping hand and give them a, a little bit of your personal time to show that, you know what, you know, you're just a human guy. And, and, and that just, I mean, everybody had to start somewhere, I guess. It's, you know, there's a tendency to have this elitist attitude that, that you know, um, they're not good enough to, to play with you or, or even to associate. And, and I don't think that's necessarily right. I think uh, it's important to, to, to encourage these people to play more and to encourage them to get better and to, you know, not, not to be like, oh, you're trash, you should quit. You know, I actually, you know, I play on, play online sometimes and it's kind of, kind of disheartening, you know, I understand the community can be a little toxic in certain, you know, not, not obviously not the big guys, I'm sure, but just, it's kind of sad to see some of the comments people make and it's like, you wish they would just take a little more of a friendlier attack and realize that, you know what, not everybody's there to try to be super pro and, and make a hundred thousand dollars in a year at a game. You know, some people are there to have fun. Some people are just learning the game and you'd be surprised, you know, how much somebody can get better if you give them a helping hand instead of just, uh, you know, criticizing them for being a noob.